manager oh, about, okay. do you think I should Will be sitting right here with the manager? I don't know, I am not going to turn it upside down. No, I'll no, you just crank it. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah, yeah. just crank it. Okay. Yeah, but which way? Count. Okay. 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 While well, Patty's fixing her chair, we'll call the meeting to order. This is a special meeting. It's October 27th. It's a special meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. And we are hearing from our uh, three consultants who we have asked to present a proposal on design build uh, proposal for our water plant. And it is being filmed. We do have the door closed, but this is a public meeting. If citizens citizens can come and go as they please, the reason the door is closed is because there is some private, you know, confidential um, information that these folks are presenting. So we don't want the competition standing outside the door listening. Well, I have a question about that. Then should we be televising? We're not televising. We're taping. We'll televise later. Thank you. So you, you want to yeah, oh yes, I'm sorry. Um, yes, would you please call the roll, Judy? Indeed. Wintra. Here. Aslan. Yeah. Sims. Here. Hush. Here. McQueen. Here. Also present as village manager, Kenny Bates and water waste water supervisor. Um, so I will turn the meeting over to Patty. She is the one. Um, there was a group, maybe tell a little bit about the process that we went through to uh, get to this. We requested RFQs, which is a request for qualifications uh, from any interested firms uh, for the process of, for the position of consulting what's called consulting engineer or architect on the design build process for the water treatment plan. We received six uh, responses. The uh, selection committee went through and ranked them based on several criteria that we had that involved uh, prior experience in a design build uh, environment, specifically water plant, uh, several, you know, other uh, principal engineering criteria. Out of that, we came up with three that we recommended council uh, see further presentations on. That the presentations will all be tonight, and the first firm presenting is HNTB, and I have no idea what those initials stand for, but I will turn it over to Mark Roby and Sam Swanson and Justin and Lindsay. Howard, <laughs> Needles, Jim, and Burry Bob, the four founders of the firm. First you don't have to remember that, I take it. I know. <laughs> That's the first test. <laughs> we're excited to be here and we're glad and we're happy that you shortlisted us to uh, further discuss our qualifications. My name is Mark Rogge and I will be the overall PM for this project. Um, with me are the other water staff from our Cincinnati office who will be involved in this project and we will get a little self instruction later. But I just want to say, we are with passion for this type of work. Um, this is the type of stuff that we love to do, and that's why we became engineers. It may sound corny, but it's true. Um, Can I stop you for just, I'm so sorry. Paul, are we going to be okay? Should he, should he be talking into the microphone? Should we be, or do you think we're going to be okay with audio? Should be okay. Okay. Nice back with the microphone. Okay, sorry about that different than we usually handle. No, I think we're fine. Okay. Go ahead. We want to discuss what we call the four E's, uh, and that's entirely our agenda. Um, we bring a staff that, that's experienced in planning, design, and construction of water treatment facilities. We bring a staff who has the expertise to, to do design, planning, design, and construction in construction of water facilities. Our staff um, will be efficient and, and will execute this project to your satisfaction. And our goal is four for four. Now what four for four is, is quality work on time, on budget, and to exceed your expectations. This is how we propose to organize our staff for the project. Uh, as I said, I am the overall project manager. Um, I have a BSCD from the Ohio State University, 37 years experience. Um, I'm a registered PE in the state of Ohio. 
and I've been involved in over 20 projects in my career just on the water side for distribution, storage, uh, supply, and treatment of water facilities. Uh, the other members of our team, uh, let's start with Lindsay. Uh, my name is Lindsay Hosnauer, uh, Lindsay Staley in the RFP. Um, I'm a design engineer with HNTV, and I have a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Ohio Northern University and Master of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of Dayton. Um, I have two years prior experience in the public sector uh, working as a project manager for design and construction projects for capital improvement plan projects. Um, and those involve wastewater treatment facilities, sewers, and um, pump stations. Um, and for this project, I would be the process design engineer. Hello, my name is Justin Mason. We work on technical design, permitting, project delivery roles. I have a bachelor's in science and civil engineering degree from Ohio University that I obtained in 2009. Since then, I've worked for HNTV, working on water service projects from planning level through construction. And I'm a registered professional engineer in the state of Ohio, as well as a surveyor intern. And my name is Sam Swanson. I'll be the technical manager for the project leading the planning, design, and RFP request for proposal phases of the project. I've worked primarily in municipal wastewater and water treatment for the past 28 years and on water side both surface water and groundwater like you have here in Yellow Springs. I'm a registered professional engineer in five states, worked in a wide geographic area, and I've worked on groundwater treatment facilities in Florida, Indiana, and here in Ohio. I'd like to underscore first our water treatment plant design experience as a firm. And again, this is groundwater treatment because it's really the only applicable aspect for the Yellow Springs uh, situation. Uh, within a couple hour drive, uh, HNTB has designed and up and operating 12 groundwater treatment facilities. My own personal experience that I'd like to highlight is here in Ohio, in southern Claremont County for Tate Monroe Water Association. That is very similar to the iron and manganese and filtration uh, system that is an absolute here in Yellow Springs. Plus they have nanofiltration softening, which at the time in 2003, it was a state-of-the-art uh, technology that was so new to Ohio that we had to do a 2,000-hour pilot test. So from the planning, design, piloting and construction aspect, that's a very applicable job as an example of demonstrating the depth of our experience. Uh, to this day, I continue to work with Tate Monroe to help optimize their, their two uh, groundwater treatment plans. As, as a team, uh, Lindsay and Justin worked on a number of projects where they were lead engineers, so that was the technical uh, manager, so we have that experience, and Mark and I have worked together over the last 14 years or so, mainly with Mark's construction uh, staff uh, building some of the pump stations and treatment facilities that I've designed. As far as our experience in design build, HNTB has delivered over 20 water-related projects in the last 20 years. Uh, my experience has been four projects. I have mainly been on the design criteria engineer side, but I have followed uh, those projects out into the field where I would do equipment startup, lead the effort in operator training, and then do operational optimization after the owner has taken uh, the plant over from the contractor. Mark and I, in 2004, uh, started up a design build project for a industry in Mason, Ohio. And that was groundbreaking because in 2001, design build was a new format here in Ohio. So we worked through the permit to install process with Ohio EPA. So it was an important aspect in being able to deliver that job. And it, again, it's been up and operating since 2004. As far as Mark uh, Patricia Spence, who is our QC reviewer on this project, and myself, we have held all the major design and construction positions and design builds so we feel well suited and be able to execute the design criteria role as well as manage the design build team. And I speak on the construction side. Uh, as a team we have done, we know how to do water treatment plant construction in the state of Ohio. We know and understand our revised code. 
uh, we're familiar with construction law. And under a design build scenario, our role as criteria engineer, which is what we're proposing, is really more in alignment with the traditional design bid build in the state of Ohio in terms of doing the planning, uh, being involved in design, and then also being involved in the construction. So um, I guess the bottom line is we're going to use our experience for all phases of this project to bring home a good project for Yellow Springs. And what's really important for Yellow Springs is, is expertise in groundwater treatment. Uh, that's really the only aspect that's applicable here. And your most pressing concerns are iron and manganese removal. Iron, those two metals combine to give you the brownish or, or darkish gray water. And through a combination of aeration, detention, and chemical conditioning is how you absolutely you know, oxidize those metals and then remove them through settling and then filtration. You currently have deep bed gravity filters, which are more applicable to surface water treatment plants. Uh, we would look at, for the new facility, pressure filters, which are much more applicable, much more widely used, and from a, both a capital and operating costs, uh, much more uh, effective than, than uh, deep end filters. Uh, so th those are the two aspects that we absolutely need to do, uh, iron and manganese removal and pressure filtration. Softening is an option. You know, some of your neighbors, uh, like Springfield, soften their water. Some, like Xenia, do not. We're well versed in the five technologies, the three that are accepted by Ohio EPA, the two that are emerging technologies. So we look at uh, those as well. Now the thing about treating groundwater is that you do produce three waste streams. One's a solid stream, and that would be the iron and manganese. And then two of them are liquid streams. The filters re require backwashing, so that's a waste stream. And then softening, if you choose, uh, to go with it would also have a separate waste stream. So it's really important to characterize those because they all require a certain permit. Uh, whether you would direct discharge, then your water treatment plant would require an NPDES permit, which is the permit your, your current wa wastewater plant operates under. Or you could take those wastes to your wastewater treatment plant as an indirect discharge, but still then you'd be classified by your wastewater treatment plant as an industrial user. There's also an overall arching uh, permitting process called the PTI, which is the permit to install. So regardless of the facility that you'd come up uh, with, or we'd come up with, that uh, you would have to get that permitted and reviewed by Ohio EPA staff in Columbus. And we look at the combination of our construction and design experience and our groundwater treatment plant expertise as a means to being very efficient in executing this design criteria role in the planning, design, and RFP preparation phases. So when we, and let's like use uh, planning as an example, <coughs> what we would do uh, from the iron manganese filtration and softening standpoint, we identify <coughs> all of those alternatives. Uh, we identify them and describe them through their advantages, disadvantages, capital costs, and operating costs. And then what we would do is, in two or three workshops, narrow down those options to a selected alternative. And what's important in those workshops is we get together face-to-face -face and discuss uh, from our various vantage points. And what we want from Yellow Springs is people who rep represent the administrative, technical, and operations side of things. So we get full facet, and we then come to consensus on what the, uh, what the treatment approach would be. Now, we do that same sort of thing in the design process as well. Have two or three workshops that we then define that selected alternative, the layout, the, all of the equipment, and all of the features. Throughout planning the design, we'd also have the specialty workshops where we involve Ohio EPA, so we'd be able to fully uh, quantify what we need for those wastewater discharge permits as well as jumpstart the PTI process which would eventually be taken over by the design build uh, team. And then we also feel that our internal quality assurance and quality control program where we check, back check, Q 
QC review from an independent person that's not part of the project team except to review the products and then validate. And we do that prior to each workshop for each deliverable so we could systematically move through the planning and design phases and not have to backtrack for, for any um, errors and omissions. Ultimately, what we would do then is roll all the concepts that are important to the Yellow Spring staff into an RFP document so the design build team could bid on that. And we would have uh, aspects like where the plant would be in proximity to your existing treatment plant. We would detail the switchover from the old plant to the new plant. And we'd also then determine, you know, define what the fate of the old plant is, whether we completely decommission it or we can convert it over to both solids processing from iron and manganese removal or backwash uh, storage in, in converting the old clear well. So the idea is that all the concepts that are important to Yellow Springs staff will be reflected in that RFP document so that down the road when the contractor's finished that you could drive to the plant and see all those concepts reflected in brick and mortar, concrete, and steel. So how are we going to execute? We're proposing that our, our portion of the project would be done in BIM, building information modeling, which is 3D modeling. The advantage to that is, is that um, you can uh, virtually walk through the facility before it's even built, knowing that it's in a 3D model. It provides clash detection so that conflicts of objects is eliminated. There are other features of BIM, 3D, 4D, uh, 4D, 5D, and 6D. Um, 3D, or 4D and 5D relate to uh, schedule and uh, cost estimating that might be more appropriate for the design build team. 6D relates to asset management, where you can take that model and uh, at manage your assets through that model. And if, I can explain later if we, if we get into that, but that's the primary reason for 3D design. With our experience in design build, we're going to craft an RFP that will um, get you the best design build team you can get. Uh, one of the things that we feel uh, would be necessary is communication, primarily through a web-based communication tool, whether it's a proprietary product or HNTB actually does have uh, uh, some software that we've developed called Dashboard that it gives the team the ability to collaborate, exchange information, and during the um, criteria engineer project, that would primarily be us and then if you extend that communication tool into design build, into the construction, you can incorporate the design build team in it as well. Finally, we're gonna be here for commissioning, post-construction, startup, um, commissioning the equipment, the one year period after construction, the warranty period. We propose that we be around to ensure that the facility is being operated to its most optimum uh, method and that what you get during construction is what we plan for you to get during conceptual planning. Schedule. This is one of the key elements of this project, we believe. If you look at, if you compare the design bid build versus design build schedule, um, these are time frames that we've kind of assumed for this project. Design would be about a year long. Permitting with EPA would not start until about 90% in design for design bid bill. And bidding could not start until after the permitting is completed until you have your PTI. And then obviously construction has to follow that. So those tasks go one right after another and there's only an overlap in permitting and design. Design build, the planning and RFQ development is about a six month period is what we, we estimate. And during that period, you get EPA on, in, on board early, so the permitting process is really getting started during the development of the RFP. Once the RFP is developed and you have a design build selection process, that's about three months, that design build team then takes the ball to complete the permitting, and they can actually start design and permitting concurrently. And in, in the state of Ohio, the, the, the few projects that have been done design build EPA has actually said that they would be willing to grant a PTI at about 60% design versus 90 in design bid bill. And then 
Obviously, the other advantage uh, of design build is that the construction could start before the design is completed. And if you look, the time frames for these tasks are very similar. The difference is you start doing things concurrently under a design build scenario that can save you, this is a conservative guess, of maybe 25% of your schedule in design build versus design bid build. Our promise. We're going to bring an experienced team that has expertise in the process that helps us do these things efficiently and we can execute the project to be a success for Yellowstone. Thank you. Um, so let's just go around the table. We'll start with Marianne. Um, council questions. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, could, I'd like for each of you to say a bit more about how you, what your role is. I know you did that, but I, this is fairly new. Uh, what your role is, and then what your role with us would be. How we would be interfacing with each of you if we would be. Well, as the overall PM, I would be in charge of the overall project. So at, at all phases of the project, I would be involved. And Sam would be the technical PM, and he can speak to that. But because of my construction experience, I would then also manage myself during construction, I guess. <laughs> so uh, my experience is primarily with the delivery side, construction side. And um, Sam would really take over during the technical planning, preliminary planning. <coughs> it, so my role would be identify all of the processes that are applicable for water treatment. We look at the equipment, and both Justin and Lindsay would help with that, and the facets of working with various manufacturers, uh, the permitting aspects of that. And then as far as interface, uh, with Yellow Springs, it would be whatever parties are going to be representing the administrative, technical, and operations side of things. So it must be an ad hoc committee for that type, and uh, we carry on from planning into design. And I guess <laughs> I, I would anticipate that there will be several workshops where we sit down at the table, everybody face to face, and address issues you know, before we go in through. And on top of that, if we do use a web-based collaboration tool, that will give everybody the opportunity to kind of log in and see communication, you know, um, to look up specs, uh, get an idea of what's going on with the project at any, at any moment in time. So if I understand that we would be dealing with you more and maybe three of you during the planning and then more with you during construction? Is that yes, but I'm going to be involved throughout the whole project. So I'll be the, okay. I guess I'm going to be the central point of contact. Okay, and so then when we have these workshops, would all four of you be at the workshops or? Uh, I would say it probably is probably going to be Sam and, mine and myself. If we need to bring Lindsay and Justin, we could. If we need to bring an electrical engineer, we could. Um. Can, can you, I have one other question. Can you say something more about the 3D model? Is that an actual physical model or is that a virtual? It's a virtual model. Okay. okay. Yes. We've got about 10 minutes, so. Okay. Uh, could you briefly elaborate on the workshop discussions? I guess in particular, who's usually involved in those? You mentioned sometimes the Ohio EPA, but. Th those would be the specialty workshops where we would identify and characterize the wastewater and then we, or the plant process too, when we were doing the PTI process. But yeah, we would have contacts um, both in the Dayton office and the Columbus office that we would want to meet with. Sometimes we have to go to their offices as as well to really you know, get their input. But that's really what we want to do is stepwise make, make progress to define to Ohio EPA what we want to do and then give them the information and backup to you know, why we want to do what we're planning to do. Okay. Now, was your question related to other workshops? Yes. Yeah. 
Sure. Well, sometimes there's a public involvement where uh, you would want to have a workshop to involve the community so you could hear uh, you know, people's concerns. So right. we've, we've done those type of workshops as well. And you guys facilitate those? Yes. Okay. And uh, my other question is, uh, are there any particular points of distinction that you would want to emphasize about HMTV as opposed to, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, some of the other firms we're considering, but things that we should be thinking about that are unique to how you approach it? I would think that some of the innovation that we bring with um, 3D modeling and web-based communication tools and things like innovation to help across the, the project, but I also think we've covered just about every area of expertise and every level of experience that I think would make a great team for this, for this project for you. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> How would you use our, our uh, water uh, treatment manager during this process? How would we use Joe? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, Joe knows what Joe wants. <laughs> so we have to listen to Joe. Um, I think Joe's got a lot of experience. And I think he knows he knows water treatment. So yeah, Joe would be kind of like the facilitator or the, um, the, the go-between between his staff on the operation side, the maintenance side, and us on the design side. I think also in the virtual model, where we would have the equipment, we have the processes laid out that we could get Joe to go through and say, yeah, this, this is a, a smart layout. This is uh, it, conducive to operations and maintenance requirements. And plus, we have the added benefit that he knows both water and wastewater so that we could really draw on both of those levels of expertise. I guess one point I'd like to make is we wouldn't expect that Joe would be a buffer between us and his staff. We're all going to sit down and table talking together. So, uh, get Joe list. During this uh, <laughs> during this process, where do you tend to see most cost overruns, and what do you do, or where's the greatest potential for cost overruns? By you, a fair way of asking it, and what do you do to try to contain costs? Well, you know, definitely the the biggest risk you have is during construction. And I think the areas where you see the problems the most are in the geotechnical side where you may not have done your due diligence in the geotechnical stuff. Um, but I guess that's part of our um, benefit is that we've been through, we've fought these wars, we know what they are. Um, you know, a lot of times um, you, you get a stinker during construction but you got to deal with them. And that's what I've done for 30 years. So, but your risk, your biggest risk is during construction. And just to be clear, because of the design build process being, being so new, we are essentially hiring our agent, our agent that will carry us through the entire project from beginning to end. And so you'll always be working on our behalf throughout the entire project. Absolutely. We're working for you. Not the design build team. Uh, we're working for you. And and your your experience in construction is that typical of other engineering firms to have somebody on the team that has so much actual construction experience as part as opposed to just being an engineer? We're a dying breed. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are yeah, there are some people that have that kind of experience. Um, it's getting to the point where not many have more than I do. And I'm not, I'm not saying that to be here. I'm just offended. Do you have any questions, Patty? Uh, no. I, uh, I have worked with uh, Mark and Sam before, but I've also worked with some of the Burgess and Michael folks before. So um, I know their qualifications, so I don't have any questions in that regard. Uh, I guess my only question would be that the dollar amount. Joe? Um, maybe make a little more clear about your engineering as far as like structural, mechanical, electrical, who would cover those bases? 
the people that we rely on for that are in our Indianapolis office. Mm -hmm. um, they've been there for 70 years, and we've worked with them. I mean, that's our arrangement has been to work with them on all these projects. So we know the structural engineers, we know the electrical engineers, we know the INC people, we know the HVAC people, um, and you know we communicate with them probably on a daily basis for the projects. Uh, citizens, any questions? Citizen, I think we've got three, four. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, I have one. Um, is Ohio EPA requiring filing of membranes at this point? No. The no They're not. They, they have finally accepted um, their use on groundwater in Ohio without any uh, pilot. So, would you want a pilot? Yeah different manufacturers membranes as part of this project or just use prior data? There are now up-to-date software tools where if we get a full chemical characteristic of your water that we'll be able to predict very closely the membrane uh, performance as well as what's really important is the, the quality of the wastewater produced. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, I, I assume that this is, you guys are a big firm, so I would assume that this is probably actually a relatively small project for your firm. So are we going to, um, I mean, how many, how many concurrent projects might your firm be involved in, and how are we going to know that we're going to get your attention on our project? Well, that's a good question. We are a big firm. But staff is going to be working on this project primarily on the process side is from Cincinnati. And to us, this will be the most important project. In fact, I probably shouldn't say this, but we want you to think it's the only project. <laughs> um, we'll, you know. we'll, we'll make you think that. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I think he knows that. <laughs> I think he knows that. Okay. Um, thank you. Well, I guess maybe to your point, our workload, you know, is steady, and but we have the capacity to do this. If we didn't, we wouldn't be here. And 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 you have experience in dealing with a lot of citizen input. We have a, this is this is not typical, <laughs> and I expect that when you get this, the, the number of citizens here, so I expect when we get into the workshops, especially when we're talking about softening. That's going to be an extremely um, active and, and probably well attended meeting. So dealing with that kind of public process is something that you're accustomed to. Yes, and you know um, we like it that way. I mean that that shows that the, the people are interested, <clears throat> and I think they a lot of good good things come out of that input. And I think many times it's striking the right balance to not be overly technical, but fully describe exactly the ramifications, the costs, and again, that's that whole advantage, disadvantages, capital costs and operating costs that we really fully define each alternative so that you could look at the five softening options and uh, you know, really in, in just really a one table spreadsheet really see all of the facets, but then have the personal involvement where you s explain that and you'd show pictures and that sort of aspect. Anything else? Or we were pretty efficient. Everybody was efficient with their time, so we can take a short break. You want to talk about that you're prepared to present uh, our needs. Oh, oh, yes, sure. oh, I didn't know that. Mark, are you prepared to present a dollar amount fee for uh, if you were awarded the project? You know, we haven't actually come up with a fee, but you know, if you look at just you know the, the standards. Um, you're not allowed to give a fee based on percent of construction, but you use that as a guideline. If your project is a four million dollar pro four million dollar project, generally anywhere from eight to fifteen percent is what you would expect to pay for engineering fees, uh, permitting, and, and and the administrative and legal fees. Permitting that, that includes the permitting, well, the bidding documents, the whole. Yeah, and that's from A to Z. That's right. you know planning. Design, construction, post-construction. 
although although the bulk of the engineering is going to be done by the design build contractor, right? Seventy percent. Okay. And then they just they do they just fold that number into their contract? Yes. What you pay for on the design build side includes the finish, the completion of the design plus the construction. Hard work's done up front. I mean, if you want it, you know, we're great. You, you did a great job, kept it, kept it. Uh, you gave, got us all the information we needed, so we appreciate it. Well, very good. Thank you. Thank you, thank you thank all. You. Thank you. Are we, should, should we? Okay, the next firm that is presenting tonight is Burgess and Nipel, and uh, I believe Jeff Eilers is going to take the lead. That's correct. All right, well, thanks again for the opportunity to present to you this evening. We know Council is excited about this project and ready to go, and so is Burgess and Nipel. Three of us have toured the water treatment plant back in March of 2012 and we've been doing work in the surrounding communities. We have 205 people in Ohio, our corporate office is in Columbus, and we have more Ohio experience than the other two teams combined. All the construction projects for the community shown here were successfully permitted through Ohio EPA. All of BNN's proposed staff for this project are located within about an hour's drive of Yellow Springs, either out of our Cincinnati or Columbus office. I'm Jeff Eilers. I'll be the project manager for the project. I'm the water wastewater section director. And I have 12 years of experience managing complex treatment plant projects. On this project, I'll be the primary contact. I will coordinate the work and manage the schedule and budget. We also have with us tonight David Jang. He'll be the process engineer on the project. David is our firm-wide treatment expert. He has 36 years of treatment plant experience and he's also chairman of the NCEES PE exam committee, which uh, writes the National Environmental Engineering Professional Registration Exam. <coughs> and he's recognized as a subject matter expert in water treatment um, at the NCEES. On this project, he'll guide the uh, process selection, sizing, and water treatment plant layout. We also have Bob Draper. He's our design build leader with 36 years of experience. Bob has led BNN through hundreds of successful design build projects, uh, many executed using BIM. BNN's design build experience totals more than $6.7 billion in construction costs. Ken Timko is the fourth member of our team here. Ken will be the construction administrator on the project. Ken has 28 years of services during construction experience, almost exclusively on water and wastewater projects. On this project, Ken will perform constructability reviews He'll manage the contractor, he'll coordinate, coordinate submittals and paperwork, and make sure the design build team delivers exactly what they're required to deliver. Just as a side note, our project architect, John Cornblue, years ago, attended Antioch, and he loved the opportunity to come back and work with the community. It's also important to note here that the entire um, team shown here each has design build experience on their resume. And now I'll turn it over to Bob to talk about design build. Burgess and Michael has, has a long-standing relationship with MSD of Greater Cincinnati designing water and wastewater projects. And the MSD wanted to utilize the design field for the new wastewater treatment, or wastewater engineering building. This was the first design build project that the city or MSD had undertaken, and they didn't want to allow that the project or the method of execution would fail. <coughs> the national firms the national firms pursued this project. But Burgess and Michael was selected as the criteria architect and engineer based upon our MSD experience, our extensive design build experience, and superior performance ratings on governmental projects. MSD, BNN was MSD's guide through the project scope definition, which included the user space requirements, their operation and sustainability of building systems, life cycle cost implications of MSD's selections, <coughs> lead certification, and most importantly, an RFP that delivered the building that MSD wanted. The goals were met on this project included the LEED Gold certification, installation of the green roof, and the operating photovoltaic panels. 
This project is Citizen, Citizens Energy Harbor West Water Treatment Plant in Indianapolis. Being in served as the criteria engineer, and David Shank developed, sealed, and submitted to IDEM detailed process plans <coughs> before issuing the RFP design to the design build teams. Because this was the ninth groundwater plant owned by citizens, they wanted to carefully control the look, feel, and the facility's physical arrangement. Now, design build, the design build process places different obligations and expectations on both the owner and the design build teams. And the owner can transfer degrees of risk to the design build team with a corresponding reduction in project control. <coughs> the two building scoping methods are performance and prescriptive-based proposals. In a performance-based proposal, the owner gives up control except for defining project performance and price. And the design build teams have the maximum latitude to deliver the design, the shape, the size, quality, and quantity, and the manufacturers to meet project performance. In prescriptive <coughs> RFPs, the owner has maximum control of the project, its design, and determines the correct <coughs> and processes in the project. The design build team is then responsible to complete the design and construct the project the owner defines. <coughs> the two design build pricing methods are technically acceptable low price and best value. Technically acceptable low price tells the DB teams that they should price the exact quality, size, warranty, or features identified in the RFP. The bidder that clears this technically acceptable hurdle and has the low price wins. Best value tells the, the DB teams that the village of Yellow Springs is willing to spend up to the maximum announced, announced dollar limit. And best value is determined by the best combination of schedule reduction, quality improvements, life cycle cost, ease of maintenance, longer warranties, betterments, price, or any other feature that Yellow Springs deems is important. As the criteria engineers and architects, our assignment is to draw upon our design bid build experience and our design build experience to guide you through scoping, RFP, and the construction phases. As your guide, we will help you identify the desired plant performance and identify the prescriptive details necessary for a proper mix of owner control and contractor freedom that's comfortable to the village of Yellow Springs and the Ohio design build legislation allows this approach. We have just completed writing a criteria AE RFP for Fort Campbell, Kentucky that's received excellent review, reviews and we're just beginning to write two criteria AE proposals for the Medical Center of San Diego, California. Next slide. These projects have provided experience for us to understand how design build contractors interpret our design attempt, our, draw, our design drawings, find their competitive advantage during bidding, and their search for construction modifications. These projects were designed complete on time, and Burgess and Eichel received superior performance ratings. The first three projects, which I'll identify, were performance based best value RFPs and design award winners. And they are Consolidated Toxicology Lab, which is in the far corner. And it was the first DB project for Wright Patterson and the first DB project issued by the Louisville District Corps of Engineers. The Fire Crash Rescue Station is the largest fire station in the Air Force in inventory. And the enlisted <coughs> Airman's Dorm, up here on this upper left, is the first design build dormitory of Wright Patterson. The next two projects are, were performance and prescriptive based <coughs> and awarded as best value proposals and are national design award winners. Down here on the bottom, the Human Performance Wing, which is the largest DB project for the Air Force, Wright Patterson, and Louisville <coughs> District at 700,000 square feet, and Pipeline Dormitory. The last project was a prescriptive based, technically acceptable, low price RFP and it's up there in the middle top. It's the Starship Barracks, and that's one of two projects at 350,000 square feet each. And now David will speak to the technical aspects of your project. 
We'll begin looking at schedule. We've shown here a 23-week schedule from start to putting this advertisement out to the design build team. The first five or six weeks, there'll be a lot of interaction as we start to define what gets built, what's it look like, and the trade-off between risk and control that Bob has described. And then out in the middle, there's, there's two parallel tracks. Uh, we'll be working on the RFP documents telling procedurally how the project will move forward and then the 30% design. And then in the last three or four weeks, these come together to form what are called the bridging documents, which are what goes out to the RFP. We'll go ahead and look at the next slide. One of the questions that has to be addressed is, is just the physical arrangement, the look and feel of the facility, technically equal solutions. So it's an important to talk about what you want, the way you want your plant to be. Here at uh, Indianapolis, this is an aerator and detention tank and a tower arrangement. <clears throat> at New Carlisle, that same equipment is in this corner of the building and underneath it. At New Carlisle, the softeners and filters are in this high bay of the building. Up here at Huber Heights, Ohio, I placed the filters outside the building with just the, the piping head sticking through the building wall. We'll look at the next slide. You can divide softening processes into chemical and non-chemical. This is a generalized schematic for non-chemical to treat iron and manganese. And this is the only thing you, by law, have to do to meet primary and secondary drinking water standards. Aeration, filtration. Softening is actually not a drinking water standard, but a community preference. Um, and here you would have either an ion exchange contactor or a membrane skid. And then the next slide will show us the most complex of the four lime softening or chemical treatment processes. This is the process in use at Springfield. Start with aeration, lime, settling, soda ash, settling, recarbonation, uh, and you'll notice the CO2 gas offing there. And then filters, final chemicals, and storage. I expect this process when you see very high hardness, which you have being over 500, you have enough alkalinity that it may be possible to eliminate this process, the, the second, and then that would be called excess lime um, and be a little simpler, but still a lime softening process. Let's look at the, or my traffic light on the next slide. Took a number of criteria and started talking about these processes and said what's good, what's bad, in this slide, the things that are green are most desirable, red is least desirable. First three columns are the three major ones. There are several minor, rarely used softening processes. I included one as an example, it's weak acid. The big issue is down here. The systems are proprietary, so one vendor, you tend to get higher prices during bidding because it has no competition. Um, and there's no installed base. The operations people can't say, I'm struggling, let's go talk to the next community. Um, the cheapest of these three to construct is ion exchange. The problem with it is there are chlorides, which are the dissolved solid of most concern in the, the waste discharge, and there's sodium in the finished water, which is a concern to people trying to be on a low sodium diet. The next most expensive would be membrane technology. It does every seven to 10 years have a fairly expensive operational maintenance cost of membrane replacement. Its biggest disadvantage is it has a very high uh, wastewater volume. About 20% of the raw water goes to the waste stream. One of the real advantages is down here. If you start looking, what's this plant gonna look like 30, 40 years from now? It handles the emerging priorities, pollutants of concern over here. The pharmaceuticals, specific pathogens, I've listed THMs, which are already regulated, but specific organics are handled very well. And then finally, in lime soda softening, high initial cost, particularly in smaller plants, the cost per gallon is quite high. The other big red block here is operational. This is a hard process to keep stabilized, particularly in a facility that isn't going to run 24-7. You have to shut it down every evening, start it up every morning. You have to flush the chemical lines. It takes a couple hours to get stable water quality. Um, in a small facility, this is a tough process to control. 
let's uh, go ahead and look at some of the equipment on the next slide. <coughs> Here at the Tate Mineral Water Treatment Plant, and Jeff was the project engineer for this project, are the membrane skids, 18 inch diameter coke. Uh, each of these two models, modules, handle one million gallons a day of flow. So you would either be looking at one of those or two, half that size. If you did line softening, the, the settling basins would be what are called solids contact basins. This is the solids contact basin that I designed at uh, Lanchester. I'm not going to admit how many years ago that was, but um, it's fairly close. North Canton is a large lime soda plant, or excuse me, excess lime, but lime <laughs> softening plant that BNN designed. This is a big scale plant. This is where lime softening belongs. Runs 24-7, the plant staffed 24-7 they can get some real process stability. And then finally, this is the inside of the New Carlisle. You can see the ion exchange in the foreground and the filters lined up in the background. It's kind of what the equipment looks like. And I think we'll let Jeff offer some closing comments. All right. And now we'll talk about the benefits of selecting BNN for this project. You know, other firms may be able to say, as a corporation, we completed a lot of design build projects. The true value that BNN brings to Yellow Springs is our ability to say we're providing a project team based in our local offices who have each directly participated in hundreds of design build projects. We're the only team with a large architectural practice in-house. We have the expertise resulting from performing hundreds of design build projects incorporating green building design. We actually incorporate sustainable design features in all of our projects. We have dozens of LEED certified buildings, including MSD's LEED Gold Engineering Building. On this project, we could evaluate everything from solar power, geothermal heating and cooling, solar water heating, green infrastructure stormwater solutions, and even deconstruction and reuse of some of the existing water treatment plant materials. We can leverage our experience and expertise to guide Yellow Springs through the selection of a softening approach the water treatment plant design, and the design build process. We have demonstrated experience meeting aggressive schedules. We have the most Ohio experience, and we have a reputation for delivering results. We understand this is Yellow Springs project, not BNN's. We want to work with you collaboratively and help you come to the best solutions. BNN also brings a fresh perspective to this project. We will build in the appropriate level of redundancy, uh, but not excessive um, excessive redundancy. This will ensure the level of complexity of the project matches the scale of the plan. The community's benefits of this project would be a reliable source of treated water, control over your water supply, no more staining of fixtures and clothes, reduced scaling of home plumbing, longer life of hot water heaters and other appliances, and a reduced usage of soap and detergents. BNN brings value to Yellow Springs in our extensive water treatment plant experience, softening expertise, and design build knowledge. We have a reputation for exceeding the expectations of our clients and for delivering exactly what we say we'll do. You will never regret selecting BNN to guide you through this process. We want to work with you on this project. We want to deliver a successful project that Yellow Springs can be proud of for decades to come. And we want this to be an enjoyable experience for you also. We are ready to get started on this important project immediately. Thank you. With that, I guess we'll open up the question. Yeah, um, <coughs> I'll start with you. Just oh, me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I had a few questions related to the 23-week uh, the schedule. So first of all, uh, with regards to the workshops, how, how do you guys conduct those? Will it be, you'll lead it as a team, or it'll be one individual, or? That varies depending on who from the city side or the village side wants to participate. Uh, as the group gets larger, it gets more formal. As the group is smaller, it becomes more informal. Um, I would anticipate a relatively informal setting. Um, I like a lot of whiteboard, sparking pens, idea generation. Um, and, and let the, over the course of the day, let the, the project evaluate or okay. evolve. So you take the main lead on it then and you pull in on, on other folks? On, yeah. Okay. It, well, the three primary ones, um, 
on what its design would be, Jeff, myself, and project engineer Mark Luki. Okay. Um, and then just in sort of looking at how this design submittal is broken down, so the last 5% that happens when you finalize the bridging documents? The last five? You kind of, you can pay the number sort of 15%, then there's a review meeting, 50%, 30%. Well, there, there's, there's two trains going here. The design documents, the criteria engineer only moves to 30% for uh, complete. That's what's handed to the design build team to do their pricing from. Okay. The RFP documents, which give the procedural specifications, those move through to a complete document. And I think we showed a, I don't remember, 30, 50, and, and uh, basically final, yeah. final review. Any, any place where you show final review, there's really a pre-final and a final um, review with the final comments. And the last question, uh, you spoke a little bit about performance-based versus prescriptive-based. Uh, do you feel like there's a preference, I guess, specifically in regards to uh, Yellow Springs and what you know about our needs? Okay. Well, well, two of us will answer this. <laughs> okay. Uh, my initial expectations for Yellow Springs is that it will be a mix of performance and prescriptive. Uh, from the conversations and looking at your the materials for this meeting is that Yellow Springs does have some ideas of what they would like to have in this plant. So from that standpoint, you're moving from pure performance into prescriptive. And David has, I'll let you answer the technical pieces, but in, in those, you're looking for, we have to have a mechanism to meet the requirements that Yellow Springs is comfortable with. And my initial expectations will be a mix of performance and prescriptive. Some pieces may be performance, and some may be prescriptive. Okay. The other piece of that is you have to get this project permitted by Ohio EPA. They have done exactly one. I had a conversation recently with John Ardmini, who heads the, treatment, the water treatment plant, design review section, state level. They don't know how to handle these. They're still very uncomfortable. Their rules say you have to give them 100% plans. Mm -hmm. If you go a purely performance-based, you only take the drawings to, here's an idea, you have the right to completely change it. If you do that, you have to say to the design build team, here's your schedule, and oh, by the way, you've got to go get it permitted from Ohio EPA. They see that as a huge risk factor and price it accordingly. If you go a more prescriptive route, then we've got documents that the criteria engineer can take to Ohio EPA, and that takes that risk and the associated pricing of that risk away from the design buildings. So I would think because you've got to deal with the agency, you'll go a more prescriptive route. And it's really about defining what's important to the village of Yellow Springs in those documents. Thanks. Jerry? Okay, I noticed that your chart on uh, non-chemical softening, you had iron removal, and then you had hardness removal, but you didn't talk about magnesium. Where is that playing? You had the right screen up. Magnesium. Let's flip back to the Let's flip back to back slides. Two slides, there you go. First of all, you've got to be careful. The man manganese and magnesium. <laughs> Unfortunately, we got two alphabetically consecutive elements here to talk about. This process removes iron and manganese. And it's actually manganese, which is the only one where you violate a second, you, where your raw water doesn't meet the primary or secondary drinking water standard. So that's the, it's actually the manganese that you have to treat for. Um, and that is aeration, filtration, um, or we sometimes do an aeration of potassium permanganate feed here in filtration to go after the manganese that was high enough. Hardness is a very odd calculation measuring basically the presence of calcium and magnesium. It's actually divalent uh, ions that it's measuring. Um, <coughs> expressed as calcium carbonate. Why we did this, I don't know. Well, I do know it's so that I can write difficult questions on the PE exam. 
<laughs> um, but this, this is the unit process to remove iron manganese. This is the process to remove calcium and magnesium. If you go to the next slide, the iron and manganese is primarily going to come out in this step. Does that answer your question? Sure. Um, do you anticipate follow up after the after the, the week 23 um, or, or do you kind of just disappear at that point? That, yeah, that's, um, that's completely up, up to the village. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the criteria engineer part is to get to the RFP to where you can go out and procure design build services. You know, we would certainly be available uh, to, to help through the design and construction services phase. That would be the typical arrangement. I mean, that's, that's what we talked about, having Ken get involved. Um, being the village's rep, helping you through the process, through construction, making sure that the design build team is delivering exactly what they're supposed to deliver. Marianne, um, you know, um, so am I to gather that the information that we sent out did not include the fact that we wanted someone to be you wanted them to be our person throughout the whole construction? I, I thought that it did include the, the project administration in and I assume that was why Ken was here because I knew that's what he does. Um, but there, there are two, there are two kinds, I guess for lack of a better word, of design build. One of them where the design um, engineer does the design but they don't see you through the project construction and then they can also act as your agent all the way through. So and, and I think I think that we I focus just on this first twenty three weeks. At that point there's a transition. There's regulatory requirements about how long the bid proposals have to be out. The construction project is driven by how long it takes to build things and in many cases how long it takes to acquire things. Um, often complex electrical panels and like that will have 16 to 20 week delivery times and that controls the project. This 23 weeks is really the, the time that the project schedule is controlled by our activity rather than our activity being controlled by the project's schedule. So that's where I really focus the discussion. To, to answer your question, the MSD project that I showed the slide up, we were the criteria AE for the front end of the project, getting into the RFP stage, and then we served as the owner's agent during bidding, during the construction phase, and then for post-construction activities. And what is MSD? Oh, Metropolitan Sewer District of Greater Cincinnati. Oh. Excuse me. Okay. Um, so did I understand you to say that there's only been one design build water treatment project in Ohio? That is correct. Because design build for, well, I say that's correct. The guy who has to approve them, John Arduini at the state, has told me that they have only reviewed one. Um, that's, that's my data source. Um, the design build process for municipalities has only been legal since 2011, 2010, something in that time frame. Um, so prior to that, there was no experience in Ohio. Um, and the, 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 the projects that you showed us were not water treatment. I mean, they, they were other kind of situations that you had served as design build consultant. Sure. That, you are correct. And the reason for showing those is that we have design build experience. The design build process that you go through is a process and not as dependent upon the discipline that you are executing. Although both David and I have were, were part of a design build project out on the West Coast that was for was a water treatment plant for reuse water, and essentially there when they completed that work that plant will be able to pump the effluent back onto uh, the municipality as near drinking water quality. So that, that, that was a project that started with sewage coming into the plant and water going back to the community. It was a full water reuse project. The Harbor West that, that uh, Bob had up is a 
water treatment plant in Indianapolis where we were the criteria architect. Um, several years ago, I did a water treatment plant design build project at the Coast Guard facility at uh, Freeport, Texas. Um, we've done design build for water and wastewater facilities. Um, yeah. We basically built a small city at Fort Benning, Georgia, and another one at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So we did those water and wastewater facilities also. As in that case, we were the design build team. Yeah, in our, in our proposal, we had identified 18 different uh, water related design build projects, and, and four of those were water treatment plants. None of them are in Ohio because of the reasons David had mentioned. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, in this design build process, who is responsible for doing the permitting with OEPA? We, excuse me, I'll, I'll, you have two choices. One, the criteria, the criteria designer can be responsible for permitting, or you can make the design builder responsible for permitting. Okay. And, and typically in design build is, because I'm, I'm used to general construction design build which is very different so are, are there chain orders I mean do you have change orders in design build or I or, mean design build is essentially meant to, to, to do without change orders right that's correct but can, can we change I mean if something happens in the middle of the project and you know, can we change you know say okay we want to increase this scope or we want to decrease the scope can we do that at some yes. point yes you can okay you can write change the scope <clears throat> for the in that case, you were looking for changes of scope at the owner's direction, which would have a corresponding change of price or schedule. Patty, any questions? Uh, no. Were you gentlemen prepared to present a, a price quote tonight or no? We, we can talk about cost. Um, yes. You're looking for fee versus construction cost? Or? Mm -hmm. Fees, yes, for, for your service. Sure. Um, yeah, um, you know, for the for the criteria engineer architect portion of the project, which takes it up to you know RFP definition, and, and, and some of this you know definitely can vary based on um, you know a, a number of items, like you said, whether you put permitting on our contract or on the design build and that sort of thing. But typically, you're looking at two to three percent of construction cost to go up to that RFP definition, so you can go procure design build services. And so if this is a you know three and a half million dollar project, you're looking at hundred thousand dollars or so for that that fee. And now, you know, you could add geotechnical services to our scope, you could add surveys services, you you know, permitting like we talked about, or those could be on the design build team. So there's a number of um, variables that could change um, that let's, cost. Let's say I have a three and a half million dollar project, we're talking about design build up to thirty percent RFP. Bidding, permitting, and construction management. Yeah, um, that's. I guess that's something we're we haven't really thought all the way through. Okay. You know, again, with with help during the design build process, um, you know, that could vary greatly. You know, whether we're reviewing all submittals or okay. and change orders and that sort of thing, or just providing assistance as as requested. Okay. Um, so that would all be on addition to that criteria engineer. Joe? Um, could you talk a little bit about the uh, new Carlisle plant project that you did? Sure. Okay. okay. What would you like to know about it in particular? Um, just maybe your involvement. Cool. It was me. Start to finish. Okay. It was me. Okay. Um, from start, pretty much from start to finish, we met with the city. Um, actually, in the basement of what was then their abandoned treatment plant, to talk about the treatment plant next door that was failing. Uh, we did a planning study that looked at can we enlarge the existing plant, can we renovate the existing plant. Eventually we presented alternatives that said it's going to the only cost effective thing is to replace the plant. We went right next door. Um, I was the project manager, I was the process engineer, so I was filling both of these roles um, for that project. Um, did you work on that? A little bit. Yes, I did. Bob did as well. Yeah, architecture. That's true. You did, you did the masking drawings one. Well. Um, and if we flip back to this, we spent some time with the architecture because this street right here is Main Street. 
Uh, we're right out in a very public view here. Picture's actually taken standing in the, the public park, uh, and I'm actually lying because this is an artist. No, that's it's actually the junior. No, artist. this one's the photograph. Um, but when we were about 80% done, we did an architectural rendering of what this plant would look like uh, so that they could show city council and, and the community. Um, and except for the, the really blue sky in the artist rendering, you can hardly tell the two apart. Uh, so we have that capability to be able to show the community what the facility looks like. Um, they had no question. They knew they wanted to do um, ion exchange. They had ion exchange. They wanted to continue with it. We kind of had a race with the existing plant to see whether we could get this built before the old plant failed. We lost by eight weeks. Um, they, they had iron manganese removal. The filters continued to work. The softening process completely failed. So they were putting out unsoftened water. Um, and that had been progressive. Their, their water quality was getting worse and worse and worse over time. Um, so the funny story is when we started this plant up and dropped the finished water hardness to 120, about a block down the street there was a car wash who had his soap detergent set <laughs> for unsoftened water. He had suds all the way out to the street. <laughs> now he was happy because we cut his operating costs in half, but or his soap costs in half when we started up. But um, yeah, this this facility is one that I designed pretty much from start to finish. You did the construction CA services. on it? Yes. You did the construction administration and picked it up and then I would come in and answer. As you move into construction, what you see, if somebody asked, would we disappear? I would largely disappear from your view, and he would appear, and I would be answering questions back to Ken. It would be the normal arrangement. Um, and, and Ken is, is just comes your constant companion and shepherding the project through construction. Okay. Anything else, Joe? Johnny, have any questions? No. <coughs> Not only. Oh, I if I if I can, this plant, Huber Heights, I was also both the project manager and the process engineer. Uh, my other question is, how, how would you use our staff as you go through this process? Um, in the early part of this, I want to spend a lot of time with your staff. I'm not going to live in this plant for the next. 50 years. Joe well, isn't going to live in it for 50 years either. Come on. We've talked about it. He's promised me he's not going to be there 50 years from now. Um, but, you, but some staff member is. The facility needs to have the look, the feel, the arrangement that you want to live in. I can't do that without talking with you, without knowing what it is you want what your preferences are, what the things are that you really hate. Um, and I think that's one thing that distinguishes our design process is we spend more time talking to the operators. Um, certainly the other staff we're going to be back and forth with. Um, the basic decision of treatment technology I think has to broaden out. Uh, there is the issue, how important is the issue of sodium in your water to you? Uh, how important is the quality of the wastewater. Something we haven't talked about, and I need to say, what happens to the waste stream out of any of these processes heavily controls which one's most cost effective. Um, and in this case, I had a really easy solution. That one was a little more complicated. But when you start talking about what does a treatment plant cost, we can kind of tell you what the treatment plant costs with typical solids handling. The solids handling it's at all complex that can change dramatically. Um, so the, the cost of that solid, the definition of that solid, can it go to your wastewater plant? Do we have to do an NPDES permit and discharge to a stream? Do we have to treat it? That affects cost, scope, complexity to a great deal. Citizen questions? Um, Jerry, go ahead. Uh, was there a detailed scope of work uh, presented to your firm for this? It was, there was an, RF, uh, an RFQ put out that had certain things that needed to be addressed in the RFQ, and then the six responses for the RFQ were um, 
evaluated by a committee and ranked according to certain criteria that we had as experience uh, in design builds, then specifically experience in design build for water plans. Um, we had several other criteria. The three top ones are here tonight to present their proposals based on the in or initial RFQ that was put out. So would you say we're somewhere in between a statement of qualifications and a proposal then or what? Yes. Okay, so uh, the way I look at this, uh, you're doing what's normally considered in the industrial world, world is called front end loading. Uh, and so you're gonna do a preliminary design and you're gonna produce a capital cost estimate, plus or minus how many percent? Um, for, for the cost estimate? Yeah. That will, will vary as we go through that 20 week process. According to state law, you can't award the project if it's more than 10% over our estimate. If you're doing a best value presentation, you're saying to the design build team, this is how much money we're spending. Tell us the best finished product that you can give us for that number of dollars. So it depends what you decide about whether you want to do a, a prescriptive or a best value kind of design build proposal. But when that decision is made and the village says this is what we want, you'll produce a capital cost estimate? Yeah. And that will be plus or minus 10 percent according to law? Well, it can't. If, if it is prescriptive, it can't be more than 10% over our estimate. If it's the best value, it can't go over that estimate at all. I have missed projects by more than 10% the other direction. We have a project that came in at about two-thirds of what I had estimated a couple years ago. Actually, it was his fault. Um, he was the project manager on Claremont County. It came in about two-thirds of our, uh, our estimate. Uh, but by, by law, you can't award it if it's more than 10%. Okay. Do, do you envision uh, if you're awarded uh, uh, if this discussion goes further you're going to produce a list of deliverables yes yeah before we give you a price we would have a detailed scope of work that would be based on that okay and my last question is obviously you're engineers and you're talking about design build what's been your participation in design build do you team up with a uh, another contractor or what we <clears throat> the answer the short answer to your question is yes we've teamed up with uh, a number of contractors across the country and locally we have worked as a as a as the design agent for contractors on the design build team that's the back end that we've discussed here we have also served as the criteria architect and engineers for the owner on the front end writing the rfp proposal that the design build team uses as their basis for preparing their bid and then subsequently <coughs> using those criteria to develop their design documents that meets the quality that the project is required to perform, uh, provide. So we work both sides of it. So we can't do both. They can't do both. We can't do both. Can't do both. Can't do both. So, so these guys will not be our design build engineer. They, yeah. they, will, they will get us to a certain percentage then we will take those drawings and we will put it out for bids to a design build contractor that engineer who will have an engineering firm who will continue it take it to completion are they eligible to do the detailed design no 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 excluded no yes yes they can't yeah. do both sides yeah we will remain your representative where we could not participate on the other side okay thank you yeah. any other questions any other matt i, I have a question um the question about the wastewater discharge. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Any, would you care to like um, add to that? Consider where we are with respect to the uh, Little Miami River Basin and being so far up upstream. Um, it's doable. It's not easy. The easiest solution is for the membranes. Well, for the membranes, we probably can dispose of that issue currently disposed of as a lagoon that infiltrates in your well field. 
if you go to iron exchange softening, you don't want to infiltrate that chloride load uh, because you would start to put that salt load back down into your own oxygen and then you would feel like you were Cambridge who contaminated the well field with their roadway salt. Um, lime, the lime sludge out of a lime plant is generally legumed and allowed to be water and then taken to agricultural land as a lime supplement. Um, in some cases, and it's probably the cheapest thing to do, although you're a long way off, is to pump it to the wastewater plant. EPA will allow a total dissolved solid in the stream, even in the upper Little Miami of 1,500 milligrams per liter. Your wastewater plant is currently discharging about 900 milligrams per liter. Most of that, quite frankly, is probably salts from home water softeners. So you would basically be taking that load out and putting this load in. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think if you were able to go to the wastewater plant, they would change that discharge much more. But you've just got to work through each one of those, and, and they, can get, they can get expensive depending on what you are able to do. Mary, you had a question? Yeah. <coughs> I think we had heard that Ohio was moving away from permitting ion exchange softeners. Anything you could speak about? Mm, they're, mm, yes, um, they're not moving away from permitting ion exchange. There's been no discussion of that. They have the concerns for the chlorides going to the stream. The current permit is 1,500 milligrams per liter total dissolved solids. What they were considering was reducing that limit to 750, which was going to make ion exchange a very difficult waste stream to handle. That is now completely off of the table. Um, they don't even have it on their regulatory agenda for the foreseeable future. There is some discussion inside the agency that when they do bring it back up in a decade or so, they're going to be looking at not total dissolved solids, but specific ions. And then what they'll try to do, and, um, I don't have a slide there, uh, would be to control chloride in particular and sulfate in particular. Um, there is such an installed base of ion exchange in this state that they're somehow going to accommodate that. That's going to remain a viable technology. Thank you. <coughs> I think it will be done here. Okay. Well, thank you, Jeff. Anything else? You, what you, what I, I just wanted to make one comment. Can you flip to the slide to the buildings that Bob showed at the end? Because somebody asked if these were buildings, not treatment plants, and I wanted to make one comment about them. <coughs> With the exception of Starship, one of the things we wanted to show you is we've done this locally. With the exception of Starship, all of these facilities are at Wright Patterson. This is our local work. This is our office's work. This is not a national company showing you selected projects from, from all over the country. This project is also our office, but it doesn't happen to be a right Patterson. So that was one of the reasons for picking these projects, is this is what we've done in the neighborhood. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Good presentation, and we appreciate you coming and visiting us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, yes.
come back jump the wire and disconnect them. We have a system that it's on the agent's file. So it's just doing this quick because I was at the office, it went off the light. What happened is when it blew, it blew the shut the system down and then a recloser automatically pulled the highway PA. And you figured out what that had nothing to do with what happened in that house, that residence. That's a big issue. Yeah, what's the story? Oh, that is on the spot. Yeah, the working code pushes you kind of just right in the front part. It was part of our system. Thanks. How many houses? One. Yeah. 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 The neighbor didn't want to let you guys. The neighbor for I went to the Yeah, we always have a lot of neighbor day or we hired. You know, so it's brought to the back right and we've already got the solid. I know you got a nice hill the detail process and maybe sort of got the other one was on the neighbor. That's just for all the states, every state's basically. Was it Ted Leonard? Yeah, Ted Leonard. It's the new model of style. Oh, oh, that's a surprise. Yeah, that's what I heard. I didn't know where it was. You mean the one on the north side? Yes, it's on the north. Well, these are the works interviewed at the other engineer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I would just be encouraged. I'd send you an NGO. Four, 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 nine. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, are you going to edit this? Thank you. So you'll cut out all the breaks. So I uh, <laughs> always be courteous, and that was the last time. For that. Uh, okay. It is what it is. Yeah. 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 I don't know, but I've got a level. It's going to be level when I measure. I'll tell you that. Cholesterol. Yeah. 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 I don't know, but I've been 
Team today um, with myself, uh, my name is Brett Casey. I'll be our project manager. Um, with me also is Nicole Sajak, and, and Nicole really will be the, the person who um, we work with the, with the village and listen the most of. Um, and she'll be kind of the leading person for us in a lot of the projects. Um, I've also got John Eastman with me. Um, Y'all know John. Uh, John really will function uh, in a technical advisor role with us, but also will be heavily involved in the software evaluation. In addition to uh, the three that we have here, um, there's a whole host of other folks that, uh, that are not with us tonight. Um, and these resources, it's important to know, um, are for the most part in Ohio, between our Cincinnati office and our Columbus office, and then with LDG and Post on as well. So these are, for the most part, all local staff that will be assisting us in this project. Um, as far as anything in Sawyer goes, uh, all we do is water waste water work. So we focus on, um, we've got uh, both local and national water experts. We've got about 50 staff, 50 minutes instead in Columbus office, focused entirely on drinking water and waste water treatment. Uh, LGB has about 80 staff, been pretty mild in the village. Um, and, uh, and as you know, John, uh, as a resident of Yellow Springs, um, with extensive knowledge of, uh, of the history of Yellow Springs. Our water treatment experience um, is the handout that you should have with more detailed information about a lot of the projects. Um, the first one I want to hit on is, is the project we're doing for Englewood, Ohio. Very similar softening evaluation for Englewood where we looked at lime softening, uh, membrane softening, and also uh, weak acid cation exchange. Um, at this point, we're going to pilot the weak acid cation starting sometime later this year. Um, and Nicole is the lead person on, on that project for us. Um, there's other projects listed on that project sheet for the, the handout as well. Um, and on the right hand side, um, I looked at some of the projects that, um, design projects that we've been involved in, our project teams have been involved in, and have some similarities to you know, the spring, spe specifically with ground, groundwater treatment. Next slide. All we do is water treatment and wastewater treatment. Um, we've highlighted a couple of our design build projects, alternative delivery projects that we've been involved in. These are three projects that our project team members uh, have worked on. Um, and the first um, is in the project where we are the owner's agent for Kentucky American. Uh, it's a construction manager at risk project. Uh, that project we just completed the final design on and we'll be starting construction in some of the first year. The last two projects, the one for Indiana American and Illinois American, those are uh, projects where we would be the engineer on the design group. So we've, we've seen both sides of this, both as the owner's agent and also as the, as the engineer on the design group. So our project team brings uh, a recent history of softening evaluation. We've done this a number of times. We've done it recently in the work. Um, and experience with all the softening techniques that we're going to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. 
take care of it. Where is that? Which one? The interface that was designed to Pictures of the schedule. Somebody's got to take that. Respect a lot of you. Oh, yeah. Well, take that. There's always a schedule on the computer. Yeah. 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 Y
Team today um, with myself. Uh, my name is Brett Casey. I'll be our project manager. Uh, with me also is Nicole Sajak, and, and Nicole really will be the, the person who um, we work with the, with the village and listen the most. Out. Um, and she'll be kind of the leading person for us in a lot of the projects. Um, I've also got John Eastman with me. Um, you know John. Uh, John really will function uh, in a technical advisor role with us, but also will be heavily involved in, in the software evaluation. In addition to uh, the three that we have here, um, there's a whole host of other folks that, uh, that are not with us tonight. Um, and these resources, it's important to know, um, are for the most part in Ohio, between our Cincinnati office and our Columbus office, and then with LJB and Post Office as well. So these are, for the most part, all local staff that will be assisting us in this project. Uh, as far as anything in Sawyer goes, uh, all we do is water waste water work. That's what we focus on. Um, we've got uh, both local and national water experts. We've got about 50 staff, 15 of us in the Columbus office, focused entirely on drinking water and wastewater treatment. Uh, LGB has about 80 staff within 30 miles of the village. Um, and, uh, and as you know, John, uh, as a resident of Yellow Springs, um, with extensive knowledge of, uh, of the history of Yellow Springs. Our water treatment experience, um, there's, there's a handout that you should have with more detailed information about a lot of the projects. Um, the, the first one I want to hit on is, is the project we're doing for Angle Oil Pile. Very similar softening evaluation for Angle Oil where we looked at lime softening, uh, membrane softening, and also uh, weak acid cation exchange. Um, at this point, we're going to pilot the weak acid cation starting sometime later this year. Um, and Nicole's the lead person on, on that project for us. Um, there's other projects listed on that project sheet for the, the handout as well. Um, and on the right-hand side, um, I've listed some of the projects that, um, design projects that we've been involved in, our project team's been involved in, and have some similarities to Middle Springs, specifically the crown, groundwater treatment. Next slide. All we do is water treatment and wastewater treatment. Um, we've highlighted a couple of our design build projects, alternative delivery projects that we've been involved in. These are three projects that our project team members uh, have worked on. Um, and the first um, is in the project where we are the owner's agent for Kentucky American. Uh, it's a construction manager at risk project. Uh, that project we just completed the final design on and we'll be starting construction in some of the first year. The last two projects, the one for Indiana American and Illinois American, those are uh, projects where we would be the engineer on the design. So we've, we've seen both sides of this, both as the, 
owner's agent and also as the, as the engineer and design team. So our project team brings uh, a recent history of softening evaluation. We've done this a number of times. We've done it recently in the work. Um, and experience with all the softening techniques that we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to talk about you know, Nicole, a little bit about the, the techniques that we'll look at. Um, when I was here um, in front of you a few months back, we get more specifically on those techniques. But we've got experience with all of these softening techniques. Key to all of these is the disposal issue. Again, Nicole's going to play on that a little bit more. But we understand what has to happen to dispose of the waste stream for any of these technologies. And then our design build experience, our water treatment plant design build experience, which our project team has worked on in the Midwest region. So Hazen Sort provides that fresh look, um, both our, our local uh, water treatment experience and also our, our national experts that can support us in this project. But also John's unique connection to the village um, and his knowledge of the plant and the distribution system. So in the end, our goal is that these lessons learned um, for both our softening experience and our water treatment design build experience will result in a cost-effective and very focused, uh, schedule-focused project um, so that, for the village so that you get the project that you're performing. So before I turn over to Nicole, I just want to briefly run through the project objectives, um, a facility that represents the mission and the vision of Yellow Springs. Achieving all the regulatory and village-established treatment goals, that's, that's critical. Effective coordination of the DV activities, again, to make sure that you get the project that you desire. Excellence in quality design and construction. And capital and operational efficiency. And this is important um, when we talk about cost. There's capital cost, but there's also the operational cost associated with each of these technologies. And those two are, are critical in determining the overall cost of the village in the end. And in the end, we want to minimize the risk so there aren't any surprises for you. So you've heard a little, about, a little bit about who we are and what our past experiences are, and what you really want to hear now is how the village of Yellow Springs can be able to leverage the experience and what we've learned for a better project. Um, so the best lesson that we've learned is that having a clearly defined roadmap plan where you want to get to um, from the get-go is uh, the best way to have a successful project. And so this, I've just kind of laid out some of the basic steps that we would go through. Um, in the first box, you'll see um, what we want to do is take a look at the design capacity of the treatment plant, um, knowing the village's vision, where they see the future going. Um, we want to make sure that we're right-sizing this plant and not oversizing it. Um, I think the number that's been thrown around is one in GD, but we would confirm that to start with based on historical records and see where we get to. Um, and then we have been talking, this RFP has been for softening, uh, softening the treatment plan. And this is the village's decision of which direction they want to go. And the one thing we want to do is facilitate a discussion to make sure that the village is coming together, we have a clear direction, and we decide on softening. Not just softening, but what we're talking about is a centralized softening. Um, the majority of the residents have indicated in surveys they home soften. So this project is talking about centralizing that and having a, a group decision. And so what we're proposing is a public involvement to talk about the cost and then the environmental impacts and the health impacts of that softening. And then based on the decisions, we'll have a healthy dialogue and a decision point. And from that point, if you decide to move ahead with softening, um, what we want to do is look at the different options before us and figure out what is the best solution for the village. Whether it's you know the same options, it's going to be pretty consistent across everyone that looks at this. And the line softening, membranes, weak cat cation exchange, and we also have to fluid that up there as an option. It's a formal line softening. Um, but if the village decides that that's not the way to go, that's not what they decide, that's fine. And we would be looking at iron and manganese removal still. Um, we need to get that manganese removal step in there for the process. And then once that decision is made, we know which way to proceed. The preliminary engineering report that we're talking about would address both um, costs, capital today's dollars, um, operations, O&M costs, 
And what they would do to plant staffing. Um, when we start looking at different treatment options, um, Ohio EPA has guidelines as to how much staffing they can add for, uh, for different types of softening processes. And then most importantly, we would be looking at waste stream disposal and maintenance and operation of the plant um, prior to construction, during construction, and transitioning. And based on the desires of the village, we would take all that into account and work very closely with the utilities department. And that's when the RFP documents would be crafted um, as the basic statement to the DB consultants of what we want to do. This is our plan. This is where we want to go. So I'm stepping back to this public involvement. Um, there are some key questions that we would love to facilitate and talk about um, with the village. And some of these that we're talking about costs, but we're also talking about environmental and health issues. Um, and we have the experience and we have the knowledge to be able to focus on this. We looked at the different technologies for other utilities we've mentioned. We know the technical aspects. These are aspects that are going to be very specific and very unique for the village of Yellow Springs. And so this is where we put the heart of what our project is going to be. And so all water treatment processes have both a chemical aspect and a waste disposal aspect. And understanding these pieces of the treatment process that you want is going to be the most critical. The process that you choose doesn't stop just with whether it's an ion exchange or a membrane with that box. It's what connects to it. And so we do have the knowledge and the expertise to know about um, disposal. And we know that this is going to be a tricky situation because we don't have a sewer, sewer out there. And um, we're looking at direct discharge to the Little Miami. So that needs to figure into our decision making. It's not something to be taken lightly or glossed over. Um, and so this, these are the different options, and I'm not going to go through them all, um, but we're going to give this serious consideration. And so our job is see it as a three-step approach. It's a preliminary sign report that we're just talking about, the RFP, and then construction. So looking at each piece of this, I already mentioned that we have experience and we've gone through the um, different techniques, the different technologies that are out there. We're comfortable and familiar. We'll take a specific water quality goals and um, historical data that we have here, figure out which one is going to be the best for the village of Yellow Springs. Most importantly, it's going to be the other factors coming into play. The maintenance of plant operations during construction. This isn't a small afterthought. This is the water that you guys need to depend on for the 18 months while we're in design and construction. We need to make sure that the plant is up and running and very reliable during that time. And then also, when it's time to transition to the new plant, how do we take pieces out of service to bring the new stuff in? And so that's going to be thought about early on and part of the design, so it's not a gray up thing out in the field. And then we have the health effects of softening that we're going to address with the village. And then also the site issues, we've talked about the waste stream and the discharge, but we also have to start talking about potential floodplain and wetlands for parcels that you have out there, making sure we have everything identified and called out on early on in the stage. And as I mentioned, we believe that we can do this in one to three months. It will depend on how much involvement, that's why we have a range in there, um, how much directive we're going to have, how much involvement the public will be, um, and so we have a range of one to three months. And the culmination of that uh, preliminary design report will be sitting down with the utilities. We decided on the process. We decided where we want to go. So let's talk about the way that we're going to get there. The type of contract we're going to use, the type of TV, there's different forms of alternative delivery. And then what we're also going to do during this point is start building some bridging documents, our specs, <coughs> and some preliminary drawings. And this is the stage of the water utilities group really wants to make sure that they know the quality of what they're doing, what type of pipe we're going to be using, how much redundancy we want to put in, um, what exactly the features are that you want to see. Writing that into the RFP, that gives that minimum standard of quality that we're telling you expect this out of UV. <coughs> you bet our job, this is what you expect to have to give to us. Um, can you go back for one second, I'm sorry. 
And so the other part of this is once we put it out and onto the street, and we have people turning in their bids, during that month of advertising, we would sit down and we would talk with the village about priorities of how we're going to select the needs Cost is one component, experience is one component, um, quality of their work, maybe local um, participation. Whatever your goals and ideals are, we'll work that into an evaluation matrix. And so we're not selecting a DD contractor based on one characteristic or another. We will weight them and we'll combine score for the decision so that we're on. We have an objective method of determining who our DD contractor will be. And this alludes to, we were talking a little bit about um, how long this would take. We're going to be putting these RFP documents together, and there's different modes of um, alternate delivery. And this is just that illustrating that between the modes, we can we have some sway into how long maybe the design takes and how early we introduce the contractor into it. Um, maybe whether we want to allow them in some of the decision-making process or not make up the minds and just dictate what we want to see in the beginning designs. Because at the crux of it, what's going to happen is that the village of Yellow Springs is putting out a RFP to build their water treatment plant. And what we want to emphasize strongly is that that RFP, how critical it can be if, to maintain your quality, make sure your expectations are met. DB contractor isn't going to meet expectations that either they don't know about or they aren't obliged. So they're going to be the ones going out and hiring the subcontractors and suppliers and anything that could be left undefined, they'll be making that decision from that point forward. And then from there we'll move into the construction phase and we have plenty of experience working hand in hand with contractors making sure that the requirements we built into the RFP actually get translated through shop drawings and the actual construction process. We see that it's being built the way you want it to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. And so we're estimating that between the preliminary design, we're going to shift a little bit, maybe three months to take as a maximum, three months for getting the request for proposals out there and selecting that contract, and then 12 months for construction. We're looking at about an 18 month window to, to bring a water treatment plant up. And hopefully, through this all, what I've answered is why us. I mean, this is what we do. We are the water treatment experts. We have the local presence and roots, understanding it. And we have experience with bringing uh, successful water treatment plants in with accelerated schedules. Um, Mary Ann, do you want to start the question? Um, I understand that uh, in, your, in uh, Ohio, there's only been one design through water treatment plant. Um, that was what we were told. So my question is, do you see any problems in getting <coughs> permits or any other thing like that, given that design build apparently is not that common in Ohio yet, the water um, And You are correct. Um, the, the, the states that surround us, and you saw our examples are from Illinois, Indiana, and, and Kentucky. Design builds are much more common. Um, you know, there's still going to be requirements that we have to meet with Ohio EPA. There, there's certainly, uh, I'm on the technology committee with Ohio EPA. The technology committee is a group of uh, representatives from EPA, from uh, consultants and from municipalities all over the state. And that's one of the topics that we're discussing in terms of what do we need, what does, what level of detail do our drawings need to be um, in order to satisfy EPA to get the permit. So those discussions are already ongoing um, within that technology committee. Um, so they're, they're thinking about it. Um, they haven't had a lot of projects come their way. Um, so it will be a bit of a, um, you know, a, a different um, thought process for EPA in terms of how they permit. I don't think it's gonna be a problem, but I do think it's gonna be a challenge as communities start to approach projects. Um, I mean, would you anticipate that it would slow the project down? I don't anticipate it would because I think that is going to be going parallel. Um, so if you think about um, what these documents look like um, at that point where you hire your DB consultant or your DB team, um, you're going to be at that 10 to 30% stage. Um, so I don't 
stage. So Ben, as you're going parallel um, with, with completing the design and submitting for permits, I don't think it's going to slow the process down. There is one wastewater project that was done, that I'm familiar with, but you're just consultant, that was done um, uh, with design builders for the city of Delaware. Um, Tom Schaefer, who's now works for Hazen and Sawyer, um, at the time worked for the consultant that was the um, engineer on that project. So there are projects um, that have been done this way. I don't anticipate it would affect the schedule because of that parallel track. I think my, my gut reaction to that is that um, whether it's Ohio or whatever state, the um, permitting agency tends to really appreciate being brought in on the front end of a project rather than being handed 95% drawings and say, okay, well, we're done. Just put your stamp on it. Um, so I think that in that aspect, the design build kind of helps because you, you have to have that dialogue as you're figuring things out and bringing them in at a 30% stage. It makes more sense from a contracting, but then they appreciate it because they have a heads up more. Can you elaborate a little bit on the uh, softening evaluation process you use with Inglewood? Sure. Um, so we first did a raw water analysis, figured out um, characteristics, what their raw water is composed of, cations, cations. And um, we took a look at the capital cost for what it would be to construct a uh, line softening facility. Um, they had pressure filters, which in the state of Ohio, um, they don't like you using those lime soft we look at what ancillary facilities they would need and we put a cost together for all that. And then we took a look at that solicited close for the chemicals, the lime, um, and the feed facilities. And we took a look at their staffing requirements. Um, and basically formulated a matrix between all of them. We went to the, did the same for WAC, we went to the manufacturers, figured out what ancillary. And it was a little bit trickier in Inglewood because we are trying to reuse pieces of their um, plant, um, their wells, um, pump it up to such a great pressure that it flows all the way through the plant and out the door. So we were trying to work with our hydraulic profile as well. Um, so we did the capital costs, the O&M costs, and then we took a look at um, intangibles, like siting and um, I don't know how else you put it, but you know, the handling of the sludges, the ick factor of things. Um, we, we tried to take those intangibles into account and we worked with them to figure out what their priorities were and um, let them select based on that. And they've actually selected something with a lower capital cost, maybe higher on them cost. Right. Because it fit with their budgeting too. So was there a fair amount of public participation? Well, it went a lot faster than I thought it was going to because we handed in a draft report and it was handed over to the papers <laughs> as a draft. So it was, it was very fast with getting it out to the papers and they've been talking about it. We hadn't done a public meeting like this, you know, that we've been talking about. Okay. So I guess specific to Yellow Springs with the public meeting, how would that work? Would you be facilitating it? Would John be a part of that? How would John would definitely be part of it. There's no question that would be very actively involved and we'd utilize, because uh, we want to make sure that the, the I, I, subject to, you know, the discussion with council and others as to whether it's a task force or some other kind of thing, but my personal vision is is that it's not just a one time, like a workshop that you come in and do one day and then you're done. It's a process of educating a, a group of, of concerned, interested citizens enough that they're an active, they can really contribute to the, to the process. And it's important then that the design team, Nicole's group and the people she's working with and, and Brad as the project manager, have that connection to what the village values and the, the key decisions. Uh, as you know, the recent interest in the health effects of, of you know, value of hard water. Um, that's something where I can see that needing to get resolved within the, the wider community, not just at a, at a professional level or just at a council level and then have you know, the pushback from it. Um, the article that was in the Yellow Springs News, um, the, the US EPA people um, um, at the US EPA laboratory in Cincinnati are, are 
actually friends of mine, people I've worked with for years, and we've got, and they've got connections to all the health professionals. So to whatever extent we need that kind of information, we bring it into that process. It's a process that is gonna need to be established in itself in conjunction with the village. It's not just that the village and the citizens and the council are part of the process, it's part of establishing what that process will look like. Jerry? Uh, could, you, could you tell me again the role that uh, LJB is playing with your folks? So, um, if you look in the org chart, um, in our proposal, um, John serves as a technical advisor uh, on the project. We have other technical advisors as well. But, um, so, as a technical advisor, um, but also um, John will be intimately involved in the softening evaluation piece. Uh, the capacity evaluation uh, piece because of their work uh, since 2000 with, with the village, um, and, and also this, this public involvement step. Um, we haven't talked about um, what role we would play during construction, because there's, there's, there's some on-site services that typically the owner's agent would provide, um, and certainly we see LJB with their local presence here being able to mobilize quickly and efficiently as we and we with the village determine what role we would have during construction. So that's kind of where we see you know, really John in the upfront part and then his support staff as we move into construction. And one other place that we've talked about is that as they're putting together the, the plans, the 30% design, that I'll be the value engine the value added type engineer, the one looking at what they're doing and asking critical questions. The, uh, and even just in the process of getting to today, the kinds of interactions that I've had with Nicole and with Brett have been very engaging and I've felt completely included in the process of moving this forward. So it's, it's not a box, it's a number of roles throughout the process as I bring the interface of the village but also bring my very extensive expertise in water treatment to add to what they bring independently. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so this, first I've got a kind of a stupid question perhaps. Um, the four treatment options on your flow chart were lime softening, fluidized bed membranes, and weak acidication. Cation. 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 Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so is one of those Ion exchange? Sort of. Yeah. The weak acid cation is, is an ion exchange. Uh -huh. um, when we talk about ion exchange, there's a salt regenerated ion exchange, which is kind of a conventional ion exchange, which there's dozens, hundreds of those plants are on lab. And then there's the weak acid cation exchange, which you regenerate with hydrochloric acid as opposed to salt. So it is a form of ion exchange. But it doesn't use the salt. It doesn't and use salt. And that's sort of the advantage of it? Is yeah, the, the traditional ion exchange we use in homes, and it uses the sodium cycle yeah. and you get rid of it. And um, what you end up though when you're, when you're drinking water, so yeah. um, So while it's an option and we can evaluate it, um, we don't tend to recommend traditional ion exchange for well, Let me add, can I, there's three critical things with sodium ion exchange. One is what you said, the sodium in the water. The other is the, the high brine content in the waste discharge the Little Miami River, which is a major issue. And the third one is, is that it does not remove alkalinity. And alkalinity is one of the critical components that affects corrosivity of the pipe system, particularly lead and copper corrosion. So the health impacts are both the sodium that's in the water, but the also the health impact is you don't get the, the um, alkalinity out of the water, or some of the alkalinity out of the water. You don't want to take all of it out, but but all the methods other than the sodium ion exchange process also reduce the alkalinity, which makes the water less corrosive to uh, lead and copper. And then using the weak cation exchange, the weak acid, you're using that hydrogen ion instead of the sodium to, to, to do basically the same thing. And then at the uh, tail end, you typically will have a, a aerator that just kind of strips out the extra the extra gases, um, so it's a, it's a benign 
And just to be clear, that fourth option, the, the, the uh, fluidized bed reaper is, is pellet softening. Uh, pellet softening is, um, there's some proprietary um, uh, manufacturers equipment um, that uses pellet softening. It's, it's kind of like lime softening, it's precipitated softening, so it's kind of a subgroup of lime softening. Um, then my second question is, after the roughly 18 month process through construction, does it just end there? Is there follow up there typically? Or how do you, I mean, in other words, you, you make sure that the plant is being operated correctly? How do you? That's a great question. We're actually talking about it at dinner. And this will be part of when we're constructing, when we, when we live and we're constructing the contract. <laughs> um, going through um, startup process. That's you know just making sure everything's working is a critical part. Mm -hmm. uh, being involved in that, making sure the pieces are working the way they're supposed to when you turn the switch on. Okay. But then another part of that will also be the training. It's going to be a new plant. It's going to take um, different chemicals, different operating techniques, and going through a training process. I think that's going to be critical for the success. Um, we can build a plant and walk away. But that doesn't mean it's going to be successful for the village of Yellow Springs. So I think we would make a really heavy case, a really strong case for also incorporating a training component. Maybe you can tell them dealt with Yeah, so, yeah. so one of the projects on the 11 by 17 hand out that we highlighted, it's actually a project that I worked on with my previous employer um, for Delphus, Ohio. And Delphus um, moved from a very hard groundwater to the surface water uh, and started softening. So this is a totally new treatment process for Delphus. Uh, and as we got towards the end of construction, we actually hired a retired uh, superintendent from the utility um, who was very familiar with lime softening. He spent his whole career in a lime softening plant. And we brought him in to kind of mentor the superintendent uh, at Delphus and help him just hold his hand as we're starting up the plant, help him to understand how you operate a lime softening plant. Um, and it was extremely successful. Uh, converting because we were not only converting from you know, it was softening, but we were taking a groundwater plant and not using surface water on softening. So I think finding a person to help um, that transition is critical. Part of one, one other comment on that is that in the design build documents, the bridging documents, certain aspects can be incorporated into that. So some of the certain aspects of startup, um, if we think about from the beginning, can be incorporated in, into what the design build team is required to do with the criteria engineer overseeing and supervising and making sure that it's complete. But the training pro piece is usually not part of the design build, and so that's something that would be worked out with the village. The, th the third component is a really good O&M manual. Uh, there's O&M manuals that are nothing more than a compilation of what the manufacturers of each piece of equipment do, and you put them together in volumes and stick them on the shelf, and then there's the O&M manuals that really provide for troubleshooting, provide for uh, spreading out the maintenance, the preventive maintenance over time. And Hazen and Sawyer did the, uh, that type of O&M manual for the wastewater plant. But I, my understanding is you're pretty happy with, with how that went. So that same kind of thing is available for the water plant. And you end up with everything you would get from the equipment manuals integrated into a preventive maintenance schedule and an operation and troubleshooting guide. Um, who, who do you see as being responsible for the permitting, working, and going, PA? And, and you said that you see that happening in a parallel fashion. Um, <clears throat> it, 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 it truly will be a, a joint effort between the, the owner's agent and the DB team. I mean, at, at depending on what level we take. Um, the bridging documents to, at that point, they're not far enough along to be able to go to EPA and get a permit. So at some point in that handoff to the DV team, um, we would expect that the owner's agent um, would continue to work with the consultant on the DV team to, to move that forward and get the permits. He's responsible in the end, it's going to be the DV team's responsibility to get those permits. But we don't walk away from it because um, you know, a lot of the decisions that are made during this preliminary stage um, with respect to what technique, what softening technique to use, the disposal issues, those are going to be critical in terms of the permits. 
So the joint effort responsibility in the end lies with the, with the DPT. I think, I think the other piece on that is that the, the really critical issues that have to get resolved in conversations and negotiations with EPA are the upfront issues that the criteria engineer will be dealing with. But you have to have a complete set of plans before they issue a permit to install. So you have to have all of the specific equipment criteria, you have to be able to demonstrate that each piece works together to make the whole done. By the time you get to the bridging documents, what it's going to take to do that is clear to the DB engineer. Yeah. The issues have been resolved. That's the critical piece. So we're, there's no surprise, there's really no surprises in the permitting process after you've got past that of those preliminary conversations. And that discussion with EPA right now, that ongoing discussion about what do they need to see in order to approve, in order to issue the permit, that's what's happening right now um, within the, the technology committee. Well, I'd be curious because if, with Ohio being all about, you know, fast tracking stuff and jobs and business, I'd be curious to know if there was, you know, if, if there, if, and they seem to be, you know, there seems to be efforts to, um, you know, push, push OEPA to be a little bit more customer friendly. So I wonder if there's a possibility that, you know, people are, people lobbying the governor and lobbying legislators to try to encourage them to be friendlier to design bill? It's, it's happening, and I, it's happening, like I said, through that technology committee, because this is, that technology committee has been around for, I think, 20 years now. But I think there's um, a, a climate now where um, there seems to be a good working relationship between <coughs> EPA um, consultants <coughs> and utilities uh, to make sure that they don't stand in the way of, of utilities getting the projects done, right? Patty? I'll ask you the same question I asked the other two. Dollars, money. Um, if Let's say that you were awarded this contract and we started the design, we went through the uh, design process, including <coughs> the fitting, the committing, the, uh, the construction manage the management, start to finish. We have a ballpark estimate or a percentage estimate on, say, a three and a half million dollar plan. In terms of uh, our fee. effort, in terms of our fee. Um, first, I want to say that as I'm sure the other two teams have told you, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, so I don't want to tell you something that, that you've already heard. The level of effort um, that that is involved in that upfront piece is critical to the overall success of the project. Um, you know, our, our approach would be to um, work with the village and negotiate that level of involvement for so to find the, the scope, and then and then talk about dollars. Um, you know, it's it's. I, I hesitate because um, you know when we give numbers and there's not really any scope defined yet, it can be it can be problematic. And I will tell you that um, if we look if, if I look at all the DB work that we've done, um, and I just look at this table, um, you know our level of effort can be. Um, it can be as low as uh, five to six percent um, of construction cost, um, but that's without um, a lot of uh, you know on-site uh, inspection during construction. So, so from there, it's going to go up depending on how much effort. If you, if you want a full-time resident, that really is going to drive a little lion's share of cost if you're a full-time resident during construction. A lot of it depends on how how carefully you select your your, your DB team, right? Because if you select a good DB team, it's going to require less involvement by the criterion engineer during construction, less hand-holding of that DB team. Um, so, um, so a little more care up front, as, as one of our team members has told me multiple times, you can take a good consultant and a good contractor and put them together and not have a good DB team, right? The success that we've had, um, 
in, in many of the projects that we've listed in our proposal and on that sheet where we were the engineer on a DB team is because we've got a trusted contractor that we've worked with over and over and over again. We know them, they know us, we have that relationship, they trust us, um, and it's, in the end, you, you get a good project. So it's critical that you select um, the right DB team, um, not only to get the project that you want, um, you know, but also to minimize the, the cost of that. So, is that? One, one of the other things that with construction is, it's really, I mean, some clients actually want full-time inspection through the whole project. They want somebody on site the whole time. That's the, the highest cost way of doing it. There's many things that need to be watched when it's being done because it's going to get buried. If you don't see it when it goes in, you don't see it. There's other things which only have to be looked at at certain critical points. If you can inspect the rebar before the concrete's poured, uh, you don't have to have been there the entire time the rebar was being put in place. So critical time elements can be there. And then along with that is critical times for making decisions, the uh, responsiveness. You don't have to have somebody there all the time if you can respond quickly to contractor questions to resolve issues. And that's one of the places where we see my, me having a role during construction is that I'm right here. I can stop by in the morning, I can stop by in the afternoon, I can come home in the middle of the day, whatever it takes to resolve the issues that need to get resolved or to identify or to, to take a look at the pieces that need to get looked at before you, they get covered up, before the concrete gets poured, so to speak, or the other issues are done. Uh, Joe? Um, you talked a little bit about the Hidden Lake. Um, it looks like it was the duct design build, groundwater, and it was completed. 14 months, that right. must have been a successful project. It was a very successful project. Um, it was a, a brand new water plant um, for Indiana American. Um, and um, again, we were the, we were the, uh, the engineer on the DB team. Um, so the contractor was, was River City Construction. So that 14 months um, is, you know, the start of essentially our, our contract with the completion of construction. I believe it won um, just recently um, an award for DBIA, the Design Build Institute. They went to Dallas and accepted the award. So, um, very successful project. Did they soften on that project? That is not a softening project. That's just iron magnesium. But was that was. There, was there a lot of uh, public involvement in that? I mean, did you have digital public? Um, I don't believe so. This, what, this is American Water. No. So, they. Have to make their rate case. So it's an association. American uh, Water. Yeah, I. It's a private. Right, utility. a private association. It's a private utility. Okay. So it's a it's a, it's a private utility, um, and uh, so they have to make their rate case to the state in order to okay. to move forward with the project. It was highly sensitive on the permitting side um, from an environmental perspective. Um, we were dealing with endangered mussels and all sorts of issues, so it was not without its challenges on the front end side, but mainly from the permanent side. And, and Bob Green, who's not here with us tonight, um, and Nicole were both, were both involved in that project. Joe, any other questions? No. Citizens, questions? Okay. Um, a follow-up from anybody? And Johnny, do you have any questions? Do squirrels eat? Water treatment, anything in the <laughs> <laughs> That's not the only question. Yes, we'll attack the uh, electric substation. So. Um, well, thank you all. Um, we appreciate you being here and uh, your presentation. So, um, yeah, decisions to make and you had conversations to have. So, thank you for having us. Thanks for thank, thank you all. Do you want to take a short break and discuss? Or do you want um, to? I mean, I think, yeah, because we've got, yeah, yeah, I think we're in a little different place than we thought we were going to be. So, um, yeah, definitely. I need a break. So, we all ready to go back? Guys? All right. Guys? Jerry? Um, so, um, I guess, Patty, I guess I'd like to hear, I mean, clearly you ask every one of them about price. Um, yeah. There, nobody was really, and, and I guess I don't even understand, is there 
a fixed price to be had well, for the service. And what do you think we should do next? Well, there's. A, I'm a little disappointed that they didn't all come a little bit better prepared to discuss that, primarily because I had specifically sent an email to each of them saying, come prepared to discuss money. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed that, you know, that didn't, that didn't go a little bit more smoothly on that end. I can see where they would not want to give you a specific dollar amount without a specific contract, but they should have come and said, we think that we can probably provide uh, these services from start to finish, I mean, each one of them gave you a range of services. Mm -hmm. uh, they should, I feel they should all have been prepared to say, this range that we have put in our presentation, we can provide you for somewhere between X and Y to be negotiated based on the specifics of the contract. That was what I expected. Um, since that didn't happen, um, I think that BNN's estimate of 2% was pretty unrealistic because I don't think I know of anybody who would do that for 2%. Um, that's, that's a very low estimate. I think if you think about it, the other two estimates were probably a lot closer percentage-wise um, because H&TV said 8 to 15 depending on the specifics of the contract and Hazen and Sawyer said approaching eight but then if you want more involvement it goes higher right so i think that those two were a lot closer and a lot more realistic in what they presented so i know your your goal um i because i we had agenda planning um today so the goal was that actually at the at the upcoming meeting which would be next monday that we would actually be having a contract have a contract i just don't see that happening i think that the most we can get is um it, it is to ask them for pricing i mean and, and is this a public meeting now yes it is yes okay um yeah, doors open. yeah i guess i mean a couple things came up that i thought you we should be explicit about um if, if we all agree one of them was i liked uh the jerry brought the uh list of deliverables mm -hmm. um i think that would be nice to see um and then it sounded like we're all in agreement that we do want someone to take us through the entire process, not just do the upfront piece. Uh, it, um, yes, and, and I think that that's important um, just because I think in the end you get a, a much better project if you have that technical person in there who's been in from the beginning with the, the specifics of the design that, you know, Joe will be in on the specifics of the design more than anybody here, but the fact of the matter is they're going to have conversations at their office whoever we choose and they're going to remember things that were discussed that maybe don't get translated down to joe you know and they're going to go oh wait a minute the contractor's not doing that that's not how we thought it was going to go right um i think you're going to end up with a much better project uh product in the end if they carry us through construction management Right. And then the third thing that came up was just clarifying that uh, we want them to be involved with the permitting, if, uh, if that's what we. Right. If they are, if they are going to carry you through construction management, they'll be all they'll be involved in that permitting. Okay. I mean, personally. That wasn't. Yeah. No, I okay. guess. Well, B and N didn't seem to be clear about that, and so I guess it just seems to me, and anyone else correct me if I'm wrong, that to be able to compare the three, we need that kind of number and, and we don't want necessarily quotes on pieces but i, I don't know That's well i what what you can do is you can go back and say provide us it, here's here's what we want we want somebody to do to act as our engineer to do the 30 percent design we want that same company to carry us or that same consultant to carry us through the permitting process through the bidding process which means they'll put together the bid documents they'll put out the the rf uh, P for the actual bill. They'll they'll oversee that and make sure every part of that contract is enforced and that we get that when that additional 70% is being designed, they will see that that is what is discussed in our preliminary discussions with the, the citizens and the residents and, and all of that info gets put into that 70%. They'll see us all the way through the end. So if you put out and you say, give us a price quote based on A through Z, that's how you can do it. And you know, the, the, there are certain things, 
what John said was very accurate. The level of involvement during construction is where your money gets, that's where your price goes up. And he is absolutely right when he said, if you see the rebar laying there and inspect it before it gets covered with the concrete, you don't have to actually be there while it's being laid. That's a, that, that's a very good example of, yes, you need to inspect it before it gets covered up, but you don't have to watch it being laid. Right. I, I mean, I can't imagine that we'd ever have a full-time right. job super on there that we would be paying for. I mean, and we don't have to, actually, the HTNB proposal, that's exactly, they described, he stood up and, and, and you know, basically took, through, took us through a process that is exactly what I thought we, were, right. we wanted and we would want. I think that, I think that uh, Hazen and Sawyer came very close to that, this much more holistic, you know, we, can, we don't have to get go further with all three that, that's contractors. That's what I was going to ask, because right. I think we just took two myself. I, mm -hmm. I'd like to hear from other, other folks. Um, Jeff, you have your hand up. Well, I, I'm fine with just doing two. Are, are you saying come back to them and say, these are the things that we want you to do? We right, to scope of services. Here's, here's the scope of services. This is what we want you to do. We want you to we want you to have the public meetings for the citizen involvement. We want you to examine the the ion or the uh, softening uh, options. We don't want you to do all of that stuff. We want you to see us through the entire process from from beginning to end and act, act as our agent. Right. And I think you know I, I don't know if there's if if there is a you know if there is language for some kind of you know, critical, you know, be on the construction site for critical, you know, in critical <coughs> stages. I mean, I don't think, I don't want you to have to go through and say, oh, be right. there when this happens, when that, you oh, know, no. just critical stages. I would say right. that they would know when all that is. Yes, they will. Yeah. So, any, any other comment, Joe, your thoughts? Um, I see them all as very capable. Um, I think it's kind of a hard decision, really, but. I guess, I guess, Joe, my question to you would be if, if you had your choice of A, B, or C to deal with uh, on this project, do you have a preference as to which one? Um, I think I could work with any of them. To be honest with you, it's, uh, they seem very capable. Um, yeah, it would be a tough decision for me. Okay. Um, Johnny, I, you'll be less involved than Joe, but... Um, you do have water distribution, so would you, if you had a choice of A, B, or C, would you have a preference? Because I missed the first presentation, I would like to review the tape, okay. but uh, before I would yeah. say, I would oh, like to yeah. see what the first one presented okay. prior to me. H, H and TV? Correct. Now you did take them I did take them and I was them. very well impressed with them. Okay. Because um, I know that they came back and did, mm -hmm. did the same thing with Joe. I would put them in the lead. Can. Yes. Okay. They're very thorough. Uh, the presentation was to the point. It's what we need. Um, yeah. They also but, seem to get the community involvement piece or felt that. Let, let me ask you a question um, related to because they said that they did your hazel, did your wastewater. That was prior. That was prior to me coming. But they, they just, just did the O and M. They just did the O and M right. manual. Where did the O and M manual? Okay. Which so still using. and who did the building? Uh, John Eastman. Okay. Israel. So they was a team that. No. 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 Um, they were like a, a subcontract because LJV does not do O and M manuals. So John Eastman recommended Hazen and Sawyer. And it got uh, grouped into financing the whole project through LBB because of the the monies that were gathered. It had to be through LGB. That makes sense. They were a sub on the they were a sub on the construction contract only to do the O and M manual. Is that how it worked? I believe. I, I think with the third team, just me personally, I've only been here since January, so I almost step on nobody's toes. I think if you went with the third team, there would be decisions made without consulting Joe as the main guy, as the main operator. Whereas if it was new people, new faces, they know they have to come to Joe, they have to get their answer. 
So the level of involvement is Correct. a little bit different. Correct. Correct. Okay. Plus the, the concrete, the rebar, your inspectors are going to catch that. I mean, your inspectors are not going to let them pour footings and, and do stuff. So the level of involvement doesn't need to be, I mean, Joe's here, I'm here, Jason's here, the county inspectors, there's multiple people that can look at one item and we don't need to keep paying people to inspect our work at, at that cost. That's yeah. what we're here for. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tony. I'd love to hear guys. Well, I'll offer some comments as a consulting engineer. First of all, you have to have a detailed scope of work if you're going to compare apples to apples. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you should also have expectations of deliverables. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be uh, also part of the, of the RFP. Uh, now, as far as uh, talking about level of involvement, I would ask for their schedule of fees for different job classifications, and that can be done on an a la carte basis. Uh, you know, if you want a if you want an inspector out there, you know what it's going to cost you per hour to have an inspector out there, and you can make arrangements to have him out there on Tuesday afternoon, and you know that he's going to be there for four hours, and you know what your cost is going to be. Um, but I think it's it's very important to to give them a detailed scope of work and let them know what their deliverables, uh, what deliverables are expected in order for you to make a good uh, comparison. Matt, anything? Well, I, I would just second that. Um, secondly, um, I, don't, I don't think you should eliminate anyone at this point. I think you should I, I was thinking, I agree. Thing. I have yeah. more thought about it after yeah. Joe said what he said, I agree. I personally have been in as number one. Wow. So, it, in part because of the permitting, their discussion about the permitting, it seems like they're they're tied into the Southwest District and to John Arduini in Columbus, and that, that's critical. Um, if you screw up the permitting, your costs are going to go through the roof. So that's I think very very important. Uh, to go back to Jerry's comment about the detailed scope of work, some of those things you need to think about are: does there need to be a geotechnical investigation? Do these guys do it? Um, is that a sub to them? They were, they're not going to do it themselves. It would be whoever you pick will sub contract that to Bowser and Mortar or something like that. And they, um, surveying, how much surveying do you need done? Do they do that surveying? Um, anybody who's going to put a price together on the construction is going to want to see some kind of a survey so they can do preliminary layouts. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to get a cost that's accurate. And, um, and then to go back to that permitting question, the, the big thing is is that, and I'll speak from experience here a little bit too, the company I work for does design, build, construction of water treatment plants. And it's a, it's a, you're weighing risk versus cost. The less risk that the contractor feels they're facing, the lower the cost is going to be, or the tighter, harder number they can put on it. If there's a bunch of unknowns and gray areas, one way to deal with that is just throw money at it. And if you're working on a fixed fee, you're going to pay for that. You know, uh, if you're going to pay for them to assume that risk, it's really what it is. And um, and contractors like to make money, so they don't want to. They're going to make sure that their backside is covered if there's if there's risk in the project. So that's I guess my observations. Can, can, can I ask a question? What, what did you guys think of the, the, the three schedules that they proposed in terms of from start to the time the uh, contract was being awarded the bill? Did they I think it was for doable, except for the unknown of the permitting. Ohio EPA has just been all over the map. I mean, if it's a 30-day review, then that's that's great. But well, I mean, the, the thing that was in, that I was surprised at is that the first one, HTNB. I mean, they were very specific about the permitting, when it was going to happen, in in you know, in conjunction with this 30 percent, and and they seemed very confident of that. Um, BNN didn't even have permitting as part of their 23 week right they just took process it through their 30 percent design and right. that I mean and, you know that's that concerned me a little bit and maybe that's why they were down at that two percent that, that at that two percent 
they were literally they were going to be drawn the and that's it. Like the they were yeah. like they were saying that's a very limited scope of work. Right. right. They were saying so they were done at thirty percent design. I wonder right. if it would be good for you to write up a scope of work, and I would feel good if uh, Jerry and, and Matt would be willing to look it over sure. and see if it looks sure. like we yeah. covered all the bases. I mean, I thought we had that. I I, I thought that that's what the RF was about but um, it, it the RF the RFQ the RFQ RFQ okay. was very specific about what we wanted it included mm -hmm. as okay. far as um, you know we, we wanted the the plant itself was uh, projected to be a 1 million gallon a day which is what it's smaller than what we have now because technically we're oversized so it was projected at 1 million gallons, it, it was to investigate the ion softening options as far as um, the different types, environmental and health, uh, potential effects on environmental, uh, the environment and, and health. Uh, it, it included uh, citizen involvement uh, forums, it, it, you know, it included all of that. So, so it sounds like we've got, so it sounds like what, what if possible, if there's any possibility by Monday, by Monday the third or the next meeting, if we could have that um, scope of services that we could review, council could review, and then send it out to those three, so that by the next meeting, then we could have that back. Uh, yeah, I can, I can, ref I can write it tomorrow and, and email it out um, to them. And I mean, if it's possible, if they, I mean, I don't know, council, do you feel like we need to see that document, or we? You all be satisfied to just have it sent out and then be satisfied. Yeah. And yeah. So, so then we could possibly got an engineer and yeah, yeah. DC, I mean, maybe so, Joe, 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 so that we could possibly be have those back by Monday. So we can't have. I, I wouldn't plan on it. Okay. I wouldn't plan on it. You'll have them back. You can have them back by the the twentieth or okay. the seventeenth. But I wouldn't okay. plan on it. Seventeenth November. Yeah. Yeah. The second meeting. So. Well, okay. if that is the case, then I wouldn't mind looking at it on the third. I mean, I, you know. Yeah. Although, but are we going to, do you want to tell Patty to wait, though? Or are we going to make her wait? Why not? Get I her? guess. Well, I mean. They would have, I they could have a week and a half. Well, that's not her. enough. Still not so a lot of time. I, I think we should just let it go it's out. It a week and a half. So why are They do this all the time. I mean, yeah. if you review that at your council meeting, and then set it out to you on Tuesday, and tip them until next council meeting. Yeah. yeah that's a big thing. Yeah, they've seen it before. It's not it's good time. Yeah. Well, and they, right. they, they, they know that they why, can't we, why can't we put it out to get something done tomorrow and get it for right. Monday? I mean, it's. Well, if we can do that. Do, do we need. They probably freak out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with. Two weeks with, is one thing, with, four with, days is another yeah, thing. Yeah, with Patty, Joe, and, and we've asked these two gentlemen, do we. Uh, I don't feel like we need I, to I see it. Need, you know. Brian, I can email it to you. Yeah. If you Brian, want, if you yeah. want to see it, I can email it to you as well. I mean, I don't think I'll just have include anything possible. I could add. Yeah, yeah I, I don't, don't want to hold I, up the process. Yeah, I don't think I can add anything. Okay. Yeah. Well, so she'll email it to Brian. Yeah, yeah that's. Cool. I'll just include you, Brian, and you can okay. make some comments on it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, I guess my next question, uh, when when it's all said and done, Patty, you're going to bring a. a recommendation back to council or how is it, it well I mean it, it, at this point I can tell you based on on my experience with generally uh, all three of them not necessarily Hazen and Sawyer but LJB and the other two um, and based on the presentations tonight I can tell you who I'm leaning toward but I want to see what they're you know what but, they're right, yeah, but you know because so, you know I I've heard your, your yeah. spiel and so forth but you know, I'm going to be relying more on you. Right. Joe. Yeah. And I, you know, Joe, Joe and Johnny have, have right. told you, you know, out of the three, were they who they would choose? And so, and we're at. We have to do. We don't. We can just do best. We can lowest and best. But we've got this. We don't. Have, we aren't going to be required to take the lowest. Just the lowest. The lowest price. and best. Okay. And do you think we should? It, I mean, the one guy said, the guy from H HN, HTNB said that they're not allowed by law to just say, okay, you know, this is a $3 million plant, we're going to charge you 8%. They're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. um, they can only give a range. But should we be, should we say, give them an estimate of a $3 million plant? Should we, should we put, make that part of the, 
or I mean, it, it, I mean, then we'll know. So, a percentage is percentage, no matter what it is. Just well, to, well, the other way to do it is just to say, you know, here's give us some fee, <laughs> estimated fee for each of these tasks, down through that process. I think you're asking for either a cost not to exceed or a fixed fee. Right. Okay. Well, and I have the impression, I mean, I think architects usually, and engineers usually do that, but I guess when they're giving estimates, they typically base it on percentage of construction because that's just a number that they can wrap their heads around they have experience with. Right. Okay. Any other questions, comments? So let's just let's just review what what's going to happen. Okay, I I'm going to write a uh, a scope of services. Um, the, the things that I'm going to include are um, ranking water softening options, and including uh, providing as built and on manuals, providing a list of de deliverables, uh, a schedule of fees per position. Uh, doesn't you know include geotechnical investigation and surveying if necessary take us from point a of the process which is um you know beginning the design through the the public uh involvement take it through 30 percent design with all of the options that were listed in the rfp uh take it through permitting bidding documents and then uh the uh choosing a build team and seeing it through to completion and then training the operators and, and, you're gonna, and I will email that out to these two gentlemen Brian and Joe uh, for review and as soon as everybody gets back to me and we make whatever necessary revisions we'll get it out to all three of the firms I said Brian. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. get it out to all three of the firms and ask them to have that back to me no later than noon on the 17th um, oh no! I mean, we need it before that. If it's going to be at the meeting, we need to have 13. it. Fourteen. Four. The third plus fourteen is seventeen. But we yeah, have but it. I need it on um, like Thursday afternoon, Friday morning. Third. Yeah. You, the, oh, you mean three. you mean you need the legislation? No, no, no. no I need okay, the seven. The fourth. Oh, the the seventeenth. Okay. We're just oh, yeah, going yeah, to review okay. this. Yeah. So we've got to have it by. I would. I'll, I'll, I'll tell them the twelfth. Okay. Personally. I, and then we're, we're saying at least someone mentioned legislation. We won't have legislation. We, we won't have legislation. Gotcha. We'll have to do it in December. Gotcha. Yeah, that's just the way it's going to be. So, okay. is there anything else that anyone thinks needs to be included in the scope of services? Well, there was that stuff about what happens with the waste discharge, and I don't know. That'll, that'll, that's be, that'll be part of the design process. Yeah, right. How they deal with that will be part of the design process. Okay. Great. Not being familiar with the public bidding process, and they, the, the, you're expecting a capital cost estimate from the consulting engineer, mm -hmm. and it needs to be within 10, it needs to be within 10%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Apparently, if they, if they say if they say their estimate is 3.5 million dollars to, to build the plant then when the bids come in to build the plant they can't be more than 10 percent over that or we have to reject them and start over again so, so they're going to have to do and, and preliminary what, engineering that's going to amount to about 30 percent of the total engineering mm -hmm. in order to come up with a 10 percent capital cost estimate correct Unless you do the best value bidding, which is a little, then it can't exceed the price no matter what, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. right. do, is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Do any of these engineers ever get involved in um, directing us towards grant and funding opportunities, or is that they, they, a lot of them have those departments? Why don't you in there? That include that? Well, I can, but I probably know more of them. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, not I can, but if you know them, no. Yeah, no. Don't wanna, you know, don't, don't pay more. I don't want to pay more. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, Melissa and I were discussing all those today. As a matter of fact. So, so can I get a motion to adjourn? We're done. Move that we adjourn. Gentlemen, I, I need your email address. Please. Yep.
All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you all.